وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد So before we actually start about uh, talking about Sahabi Abu Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, we would like to just remind ourselves about the positions of Sahaba in the Holy Quran. Obviously in this stage, we are not going to look into Hadith to prove the uh, merits and the great uh, personality and position of Sahaba, rather, We'll just quote only three ayat from three different surahs of the Quran, just to understand the position of Sahaba in the Holy Quran, in Islam, in uh, like from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and uh, how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala praises them. This is really important before we actually learn about Abu Huraira. The first ayat that we are going to quote it's from Surah Al Hujurat. And it is the third ayat of Surah Al-Hujurat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we need to remember Surah Al-Hujurat is a Madani Surah. So therefore, uh, it includes Muhajirun and Ansar, all the Sahaba. In this Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ امْتَحَنَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested their hearts, meaning Sahaba's hearts, for taqwa, for piety. So in this ayat, the test was done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the test was for taqwa, for piety, for inward uh, uh, condition of Sahaba. And when we have test, when we have exam, we expect the result and we, accept, uh, we expect the outcome of the test. So in the next part of the same ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ عَظِيمٌ That for these people, there are two outcomes, like two results. Number one, forgiveness. Obviously, they were human beings. They were not malaika. They were not angels. So if they have committed any, any wrong, any sin or anything, then all of these are forgiven. And the second result is azim, and they have a great reward, which is Jannah al-Firdaus. So that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already tested them and they had already passed the exam. So now we don't need to worry about their personality. We don't need to worry about their trustworthiness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't uh, test them their uh, outward condition. How did they dress or etc. No, the test was about inward condition because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who is alimun bidati sudur, who can tell what is inside our heart and inside our mind. So he tested them subhanahu wa ta'ala and he uh, like let us know he informed us about the result so therefore the, gen the the generation of sahaba they were tested by allah and they passed the exam that's it we don't need to know any more uh, clarification any more uh, testimony or uh, certificate about their authenticity this ayat is only this ayat is enough the second ayat that we we, we are going to go through very briefly is the ayat from surah al-baqarah which is the 13th ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Aminu kama amana nas. He subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us that we need to believe and we need to have Iman and Islam the way these first generation, meaning Sahaba, had the Iman and Islam. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is presenting Sahaba as our role models. So therefore, we shouldn't have any question or any any uh, like uh, accusation or allegation against them because Quran has already confirmed that yes, if you believe the way they believed, that's fine, your Iman is uh, perfect. And the third ayat is from Surah Al-Bayyina, at the end of Surah Al-Bayyina also, and in Surah Tawbah, ayat 900, you will find, and not only in these two surah, we find in many other surahs, these uh, beautiful ayats, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with Sahaba and they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, my brothers and sisters, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared that he is pleased, then do we have any right or any authority not to be, uh, to not to be pleased with Sahaba? No. Because if we believe in the Holy Quran, if we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we need to also be pleased with Sahaba. So these are very uh, brief mention of these three ayat. And these three ayat imply very openly and explicitly that the Sahaba generation, the entire generation was so great that we need to follow them. We need to follow their footsteps. We need to learn from them. We need to trust them. And they are trustworthy to us. And alhamdulillah, we need to prove that from Quran, the efforts and the jihad and the sacrifice that the Sahaba did, that itself, you know, a sufficient amount, a sufficient um, evidence and uh, proof that they were sincere to Islam, they were sincere to Quran and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, yeah, if we understand this, then inshallah, we should also understand that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is also amongst the Sahaba. He was Minal Muhajirin. So therefore, and you have in the Quran lots of ayat just praising the Muhajirun. Now, <clears throat> why should we actually study then just about Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu? What's the importance? What's the reason uh, for which siblings of Ilim today uh, choose this Sahabi only, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu? There are a few reasons. And I would like to categorize this as three uh, categories. Number one, for general Muslims, for all of us, it is important to know about Sahabi Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu because he was the gateway to the Sunnah. As we know, all of us, those who attended today, mashallah, all of you know that he narrated a great number, a huge number of hadith. So therefore he is the gateway to the uloom, to the knowledge, to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So therefore, yes, we should know about him because from him, through him, we learn about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa life, his sunnah, his practice, and all the other stuff. That's why it's better to learn about the gateway to sunnah. Secondly, because he's a sahabi, and Quran says we need to follow them. Aminu kama aman nas So therefore, we should learn about them and we should follow him. We should follow about Abu Huraira. How did he conduct, uh, like how did he live his life as a Muslim? So therefore it's important to learn about him. And many other fa'idah for general Muslims just to think about Abu Huraira and to learn about his biography. But the second category uh, is the student. Why the students of knowledge should learn about Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu uh, most importantly? Because Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu was a paradigm, a role model, and an example for a successful, a, like brilliant student, a student who learned hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who dedicated his entire time and life for the ilm, and then he was uh, like involved in uh, conveying this ilm to others. So therefore, for the students, Abu Huraira's biography is a motivation, like kind of we, we take inspiration from Abu Huraira's life, like how he managed to learn all this ulum and all this hadith in this short period of time, only four years or so. And then finally, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu is important for the teachers who are teaching or uh, involved in preaching Islam in many, uh, in many, in any way, teaching, uh, da'wah, tabligh, or many other ways. For them, it's also important to learn about Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu because it's amazing to see that Abu Huraira, after learning hadith and after being educated, he doesn't just sit in the house or he doesn't sit in, in his uh, like own comfort zone. Rather, he goes out and about and he puts his effort to uh, educate the next generation. And this is how he's knowledge got so widespread and that's why we find so many ahadiths reported through on the authority of Sahabi Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. So all of these three categories, be it a general Muslim, be it a student or teacher, all of us have actually great lessons 
moral lessons and you know educational uh, inspiration from the uh, from the life style of Sahabi Abu Hurairah And it's quite normal when we speak about the biography of any Sahabi, be it Abu Huraira, be it any other Sahaba, that we will not get many information about their personal life. It's, it's quite normal because uh, that time wasn't a time to actually uh, write biographies or to actually record all this information the way we do. So therefore, there will be some sort of lack of information about their personal lives. It's not just Abu Huraira, you uh, go to Sahabi Abu Bakr radiallahu's personal life, or even Umar radiallahu, their personal life, how did they, like, uh, how they were brought up, what, how was their childhood, etc. You'll not get many information about those stuff. <clears throat> Today, inshallah, we'll mainly focus on Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu's uh, teaching and his involvement in narrating hadith. But before we go to that stage, we'll go through this, uh, these information very briefly. So let's talk about his personal life. Abu Huraira, the name is not actually Abu Huraira, it's cognomen, it's actually Kunia, or you can say nickname. And he became so well known with that nickname, with Abu Huraira, that many people even do not remember, do not even know that he had actually a, a, a proper name or name. And it's pretty much normal in that time. If, if you look at Sahabi Abu Bakr, radiallahu an, look at Sahabi Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, look at Sahabi Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, and many other Sahaba in the generation of Sahaba that you'll find they are known as with Abu, Abu, Abu. Like this is their uh, cognomen and they were known with that. As long as they were known with that, it's fine. We don't need to know about their actual name and how did that name come out, etc. But still, we, we have few information about his actual name. And many people have expressed many opinions regarding this. But most authentic opinion in this regard, as Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, uh, authenticated this information in his book, Fatwal Bari, that his actual name was Abd Shams in Jahiliya, in pre-Islamic period of time. And in Islam, his name was Abdurrahman. That's it. So we just uh, go with this information. But why was, he, why was he given this name, Abu Huraira? What was the reason? If we look at Tirmizi, in, in Sunan al-Tirmizi, we have actually an, a narration there in Tirmizi, reported by Abu Huraira himself, radiallahu an. He tells us that the reason was he had kind of very uh, much care for the kitten. Huraira tun is a tasgheer, it's a special form of the word hirun in Arabic, which means a kitten, small, a young uh, cat. So Abu Hurairah had much care and kind of passion about keeping the kitten in, in his house, in his room. That's why people started calling him Abu Hurairah. It's pretty much normal. They, they actually attribute the people uh, towards something that they have like always with them, or maybe they have passion about so they just start calling them as Abu or Ummu of that thing. So I think that's enough for us to understand that Abu Hurara himself and that hadith that I recorded from Tirmizi, it's Hassan hadith, like it is uh, authentic uh, hadith, authentic narration. From that, we can establish that Abu Hurara radiallahu anhu was given this title because of his uh, special care for the kitten. But we find actually an interesting uh, analyze given by one of the great scholars from uh, past uh, from the last century his name is dr muhammad hamidullah dr Ma shaykh muhammad hamidullah rahimahullah who was actually from hyderabad india and then he studied in paris and he actually lived his most of the life in paris uh, his personality also actually a motivation for the students we should learn about uh, shaykh muhammad hamidullah allah irhamu so We'll come about, uh, we'll, we'll speak about Muhammad Hamidullah and his work, inshallah, in upcoming uh, sections, in upcoming topics. However, uh, just let me mention to you very briefly that Shaykh Muhammad Hamidullah, rahimahullah, says in his muqaddimah, in his introduction to a book called Sahifa 
Hammam ibn Munabi. And inshallah, I'll introduce this sahifa to you in, uh, in a minute or in, in upcoming sessions, sections. So Hamidullah says the reason for which Abu Huraira should be given the nickname Abu Huraira is Lijawdati Hifzihi. You have seen the kitten, mashallah, they are very uh, clever. And if they go to somewhere, they would remember that place and they can come back to that place without getting any, any confusion or anything. They be very, uh, they, they remember things very well. So Shah Muhammad Hamid, Hamidullah says, maybe that was another reason for which Abu Huraira was given the, uh, 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 given the nickname Abu Huraira, like because he has kind of similarity, resemblance with kitten. That way kitten remembers everything, uh, that their roots and everything. Similarly, Abu Huraira the one who had given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that sharp memory and strong memory. That way, that's why he was able to memorize and remember so many things. So that was in regards to his name and his uh, nickname. His birthplace, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who was from the tribe called Daus. That's why Abu Huraira at Dausi. Now this tribe, Tabila Daus, they actually resided in uh, Yemen. And when we say Yemen, like Yemen, Yamim Nun, when we say Yemen, it actually, uh, we are talking about the Yemen, the, the place which was known as Yemen at that time in the history. We are not talking about this geographical uh, country of Yemen nowadays that we have, no. It was more broader and more wider than, now, uh, uh, than it is now. So therefore, Daus resided in Yemen of that time, and that's why the, he used to be called a Dausi al-Yamani. But in today's map, if you look at this uh, area, then you see actually Daus Falls, and it kind of situated within Saudi Arabia, border of Saudi Arabia kind of. So, but still, we regard him as a Yemeni Sahabi. And at that point, we shouldn't forget the hadith of Muslim where Rasulullah praised the Yemeni people when he says, uh, Al Imanu Yemeni. And Rasulullah praised their heart that these people are very soft hearted people and kind people, etc. So, the, Yam, the, the area Yemen, the, the land or the region Yemen at that time, uh, Rasulullah praised those people of that land. So therefore, Abu Huraira who also praised by this statement, we should include him in this praise. Okay, so Abu Huraira was born in Yemen. He was a Yemeni Sahabi from the tribe Daus. And Daus was a prominent kind of uh, leading uh, tribe of the area. Lots of people uh, from that tribe, they had great role in the community, in their land. I don't have actually time to go through all these names like Abu Hurairah, whose cousin brother and, and some other family members who were ruler and leader of that time. But just you can remember this information that Abu Hurairah's family was a notable family of that time. And then we come to the parents. So Abu Hurairah, who his father name was Sakhar, and his mother name was either Umayma bint Safwan or her name was. Maimuna bin Tasafwan. We got these two information. And we have a bit more information about Abu Hurairah and his mom, which we'll talk about in upcoming uh, uh, point. <clears throat> and then family. So did Abu Hurairah get married? Did he have children? And did he have siblings? Yeah. We find information that Abu Hurairah who had a brother called Karim. His name was Karim. And we find few information about his marriage, but Abu Hurairah who didn't get married in his early life. He didn't even get married when Rasulullah was alive. So therefore, we're not going to talk about his marriage life now. We'll talk about it, inshallah, when we speak about his life after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now we can skip this point family at this uh, time. This is very important. Uh, part of our webinar today, that how Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu came into the company of Rasulullah sallallahu and how was his life with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I, I would like, like to request my students and my brothers and sisters who are attending today to make notes or at least to keep this information in mind 
in order to understand the upcoming uh, point, like how come Abu Huraira reported all these many hadith. If we understand this session, uh, this part clearly, inshallah, we will not have any question about uh, Abu Huraira reporting and narrating so many hadith in, in four year times. So let's, let's talk about the first topic, first point, which is acceptance of Islam. When did Abu Huraira uh, become Muslim? Well, in order to understand this, we need to actually speak about a Sahabi who is maybe not that well known to many of us, but he was a prominent Sahabi and a leader, a great Sahaba, a great Sahabi and praised by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's interesting that you will not find even a single hadith maybe narrated by this Sahabi. Yes, his, his name is mentioned. His name is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, in many other books of hadith, but you will not find he narrate, like him narrating any hadith. This is quite interesting, and we will draw a lesson from that, inshallah. His name is Sahabi Tufail ibn Amr al Dawsi radiallahu an. Tufail ibn Amr al Dawsi. Just from the name, you can, uh, you can tell that he was from the same tribe as Abu Huraira, because Abu Huraira came from Daws, and Tufail ibn Amr was also Dawsi from Daws tribe. Now, what happens? Tufail ibn Amr was from the Daws tribe, and he was a leader of his tribe. And obviously, Jahiliya, in Jahiliya time, in the pre-Islamic period, the Kuffar, the Quraysh or other Kuffar, like those who are Mushrikun, they had the custom of Hajj. It's quite interesting that they didn't have the custom of performing Salah or anything, but they had the custom of performing Hajj. As opposed to the uh, Yahud and Nasar of that time, they had the custom of performing Salah. They had their prayers in their own way, but they never performed Hajj, even though they claim to be like Abrahamic religion. They say we are Abrahamic religion, we are Millat Ibrahimiya. They attribute themselves to Ibrahim alayhi salam, but they never actually followed Ibrahim's practice of Hajj and all the stuff, but Mushrikun did. So that's why if you go to Hadith, you will see when Rasulullah salam talks about Salah, he says, that the distinguished aspect between ourselves and the uh, munafiqeen and kuffar is uh, salah. Like it is uh, between ourselves and the kuffar is salah. And Rasulullah said, anyone who does not perform salah, he becomes kafir, he becomes mushri. So therefore, when it comes to talk about salah, Rasulullah compared between Islam and shirik. But if you go to Hajj and you will see in hadith, uh, the sound is not that strong perhaps, but it says that if someone does not perform Hajj, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no, like Allah doesn't care if this person dies as a Yahudi or Nasran. In this case, Allah Rasulullah doesn't say if he dies as Mushri. Or rather, Rasulullah says uh, if he dies as a Yahudi or Nasran, because the Yahudi and Nasara, they don't perform Hajj. That's why in terms of Hajj, Rasulullah said Yahudi and Nasara, he compared between Islam and Yahudi and Nasara. And in terms of Salah, Rasulullah compared between Muslim and Mushri. So yeah, Tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi was actually a mushri. They, they didn't uh, have Iman uh, in uh, Taurat or Injil or any kitab. But they would come to do Hajj every year in Mecca. So at some point he came to uh, Mecca to perform Hajj. And the uh, people of Mecca, they said, don't ever go to that man who claims to be prophet and all the stuff. The, the record is mentioned. The narration is recorded in Sahih Muslim with details. I'm not going to go to the details. but the, Moral lesson that we learn, or the main point is, Abu uh, Tufail ibn Amr al-Dawsi, when he heard uh, Kuffar of Quraysh telling him not to go to Muhammad Salam, he said, okay, no, I need to go actually. And because I have, it's not like uh, I don't understand anything. I'm aqil and I have brain to understand and to uh, differentiate between right and wrong. So it's okay, let me go to him and see why, what he says, what's his message. If, if I find his message is good, I will follow that. And if I find his message is wrong, then obviously I will reject that. And I, I have brain, I have understanding. So it's okay. So he went to Rasulullah and he found his, the, the message of Rasulullah amazing. He accepted Islam, he became Muslim. Very shortly I'm telling. Now, after accepting Islam, Tufail ibn Amr goes to his uh, tribe, those, and very few people accepted Islam. He comes back to Islam again, 
And he says, Ya Rasulullah, because I have few people accepted Islam, now I believe if you come to my area, Daos, then it will be great because we have a kind of castle, we can protect you, we can give you shelter, etc. So come to our, our area. Obviously, some said, no, I can't go unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives me permission and I'm waiting for his permission. And obviously, then the permission came about Medina. So Islam traveled to Medina, he migrated to Medina. But my point is that Daus and uh, Tuhair ibn Amr al-Daus, he was so confident about his people that he is inviting Rasulullah to Daus. That shows the people of Daus were actually eager or they are ready to accept Islam. They were very uh, close to Islam. And at this point, Rasulullah makes a dua for the people of Daus. And it is again mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Rasulullah said, Allahum Mahdi Dawsan. For Allah grant guidance. Hidayat to the people of those. Now, my brothers and sisters, you can imagine anyone who accepts Islam from the Daos will be actually a, a response or jawab of the dua of Rasulullah. So anyone who accepts Islam as if Rasulullah made dua for this person to be, to be Muslim. And then we find Abu Hurairah accepts Islam in those. So Abu Hurairah's acceptance, Islam, acceptance of Islam is not normal. It's quite extraordinary because Rasulullah made dua for them to become Muslim. And uh, as a consequence of the dua, he became Muslim. So you can imagine his, his Islam is, is really special. Now, they don't come to Mecca because Islam said, do not come to Mecca yet. And you will not find uh, actually um, a, good a good place in Mecca to stay with me and to learn from me. It's really torturing, people are torturing Muslims. So therefore wait until I move to my Darul Hijra, where I, might, I will migrate to. So they wait in their Daos area. And after the Hijra, uh, um, um, after a couple of years, they decide to migrate to Medina. So now, first we need to understand that Abu Hurairah acceptance of Islam, or Abu Hurairah accepted Islam before he came to the Suhbah, before he came to the company of Rasulullah, number one. Secondly, Abu Hurairah was Islam or he became Muslim as a consequence of Rasulullah's dua. And now we see Abu Hurairah, I mean, Tufail ibn Amr Dawsi comes all the to Medina with those Muslims or with those people who accepted Islam from his tribe. And obviously amongst them is Abu Hurairah. And when he came to Medina, his age was about 30. 30 years old, we can confirm that through not hadith kitams, but through the seer or uh, the biographical dictionaries and books. For example, Ibn Abdul Bar's Kitab al Isti'ab and some other books. <clears throat> we confirmed that he was 30, so he was young. And he came to uh, Medina to the company of Rasulullah in the seventh Hijri, in the beginning of the seventh Hijri, which is the month of Muharram. And we can confirm that from Sahih Muslim. We have a narration in Sahih Muslim, um, not just one narration, quite a few narrations which suggest that Abu Hurairah who came and he participated with Rasulullah in uh, the Battle of Badr. For example, he says, Shahid Nama Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yawma Khaybar. The hadith is actually recorded in Bukhari as well and Muslim. <clears throat> so that means Abu Hurairah came with Rasulullah in the seventh Hijri. Now let's make a, uh, like may, let's make it clear how many years did he have the suhbat of Rasulullah from the seventh Hijriya. So he stayed with Rasulullah seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and Rasulullah left this dunya actually in the eleventh Hijri, in the month of Rabi'ul Awal of the eleventh Hijri. So that means Abu Hurairah got full, full, uh, like full four years and then uh, three more months. Four years, three months. This is not actually a short period of time. In, in this world, we have seen people uh, you know, um, acquire degrees and uh, they achieve so much academic and uh, you know, educational achievements within uh, two years, three years, four years. So do you think Abu Hurairah was that, uh, su such person who couldn't even achieve that many hadith in four years times? So this actually, if someone uh, questions like that, then we need to ask them that, look at our time. People, they, they are married, they have family and all the stuff, but still they could, they could do degrees and they, can't, they can write you know, thousands of pages and uh, thousands of words. 
So how about Abu Hurairah? Do you think he, he wasn't that uh, intelligent to memorize this? Inshallah, we will we'll talk about his intelligence, inshallah. Now, so he stayed in the company of Salam four years, three months. But in Bukhari, it's interesting to see that in Sahih Bukhari, there is a uh, narration where Abu Hurairah himself says, Sahibtu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalatha sinin. He said, I accompanied Rasulullah only for three years. Now you might question, like, we analyzed, we found out that he accompanied Rasulullah for four years, three months, and now he, how come he himself, Abu Hurairah himself says three years? But there's no contradiction. If you look at the, uh, if, you, if we analyze the life, to, life story of Rasulullah, we will find it is very simple to understand this. Number one, he says three years because at some point, Rasulullah sent him all there to Bahrain. And we'll look at this, as you see here in this page, we'll talk about uh, his, like he goes to Bahrain, Rasulullah sends him to Bahrain. So when Abu Hurairah says, I accompanied Rasulullah three years, he excluded these times or maybe these few months, three months, four months, that he was outside of Medina in Bahrain. Also, most likely he excludes those times that he had, even though he was in the company of Rasulullah, but he wasn't in Medina. They were outside of Medina. Rasulullah was uh, you know, participating in the battles, in jihad, in Ghazwa. So therefore, maybe he does not count those times, like the time they spent in the, had, uh, in the Safar, in the journey. So maybe, because Rasulullah, as Shaykh Abdullah Al-Qadi from uh, Saudi, he uh, confirmed that Rasulullah had about 44 travels and journeys outside of his residence. And these 44 journeys, uh, they took about 700 days, like three, uh, like two years approximately. And then they travel, Rasulullah traveled approximately 41,000 kilometers, according to his analysis. And mashallah, Abdullah Al-Qadi, she's very, he's very uh, uh, like uh, well educated and well grounded in his in his research, mashallah. He has written the book and is going to be published about the rahalat, about the journeys of Rasulullah sallallahu So maybe Abu Hurairah, when he says that I accompanied Rasulullah only for three years, he, he uh, excludes these things. And from that, you can actually see how accurate Abu Hurairah was. He was very careful when he's making statements. He's not saying I accompanied Rasulullah four years. He could have said that, but he doesn't say it because uh, he excluded those times he was out and about. And obviously, when you are in the journey of jihad and, and all the Hajj journey, you need to count the Hajj journey of, final, uh, of Hajjatul Wada. And also in the ninth Hijri year, he goes to Hajj, where Rasulullah doesn't go, but Rasulullah sends him. So he excludes all this time, all these months, and then he says, I accompanied Rasulullah three years. So in fact, it's actually a proof for Abu Hurairah being accurate about his statements. Okay. Now, when Abu Hurairah accepted Islam in Daos, his mom didn't accept Islam. His father died when he was young. So when he comes to Medina, he has no one to take with him. So he, he just gets his mom with him to Medina. But mom, his mom, uh, Umayma bin Tasafwan or uh, uh, Maimuna bin Tasafwan, she's non-Muslim at that time. She comes to Medina. She stays, uh, he, they, somehow they, go, uh, they manage to have a house somewhere and she stays there. And Abu Hurairah comes to Rasulullah's Majlis in Masjid al-Nabawi, he learns from Rasulullah. Long story mentioned in Sahih Muslim again with uh, full details where Abu Hurairah who wishes, like he always hear, hears uh, his mom uh, saying bad words in fact against Rasulullah and all the stuff. So he requests Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for my mom that Allah guides her. And again, amazingly, Rasulullah said, Allahum Mahdi, Umma Abi Huraira. If you remember, my brothers and sisters, when Tufail came to Rasulullah in Medina, in Mecca, Rasulullah said, Allahum Mahdi Dawsan. Allah guide Daws. And now, when Abu Huraira comes to Rasulullah to make dua, uh, to request for the dua of, of his own mom, Rasulullah said, Allahum Mahdi, Umma Abi Huraira. Well, Allah guide grant guidance to the mother of Abu Hurairah. Now, <clears throat> then what happens? You know the story. I'm, I'm sure many of you know the story. So he goes back and he finds his mom has accepted Islam and all the stuff. My point is that Abu Hurairah, who, he was very loving towards his mom. 
That's why he did not leave his mom in Dawas, even though his mom was kafir, like mushrik and non-Muslim at that time. But he doesn't forget the responsibility and duties that he has towards his mom. Second lesson that we learned is Rasul was very loving and caring about Abu Huraira's uh, mom and Abu Huraira. The Rasul makes special dua for Abu Huraira's mom. So it shows the great connection between Abu Huraira and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <clears throat> so that was in regards to acceptance of Islam. And now uh, the, his small family, his himself and mom, they are Muslims now. Now, after becoming, after his mom become Muslim, we don't know when she died. When did she die? We don't know uh, this information. But it seems like Abu Huraira now is, Abu Huraira is quite uh, comfortable. He's quite confident that my mom, before she was non-Muslim and she had questions and you know always complained, oh, why do you go to uh, Rasul like Muhammad and Madris, etc. But now she is Muslim, so she will not have question and she will not have complaint against me. So Abu Huraira comes, uh, like he becomes a resident student of Rasul, kind of boarding student, and he comes in a sufa. It's amazing. The sufa is actually a place where, uh, like. A, shading, a shaded place. Obviously, in Masjid al in the beginning, there was no roof even, just four sides, perhaps, with the leaves of the dead palm trees. On the roof, there was nothing. On the roof, there was nothing. So Sahaba requested, Ya Rasulullah, we have guests, Muslims, Muhajirun, come from different land. So let's make a place where they can stay. They can spend their time, and they can uh, protect and safeguard themselves from the rain and from the heat of the sun. So this place is called Kusuf. And the people who is to reside in this masjid, in this uh, like boarding madrasa, they are called Ahlu Sufa. My brothers and sisters, if you go to Sunan at Tirmizi, you'll find a hadith reported by Ibn Umar, anhuma, where Rasulullah says he speaks about the people of Ahlu Sufa. And he says, Adiyafu Ahli Islam. It's amazing to see that Rasulullah is uh, declaring these. Uh, boarding students as adiyaf. Adiyaf is the plural of daifun. Daifun means guest. So adiyafu ahl islam These uh, students are actually guests for the believers. So they are mehman. They are the guests for the believers, for the Muslims uh, in, in Medina and uh, like as 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 a ummah. Now, <clears throat> and therefore you see all the nice stories. It's not just uh, related to Abu Hurairah only, but in general you see Rasulullah Sallam sometimes. After Isha Salah, he said, okay, if you have one person's food in your home, then you should take another student from my boarding madrasa. If you have two people's food in your home, then you should take one student from my madrasa. Like some said, Tu'amul wahidi yakfi lisnain. Tu'amul lisnain yakfi salasa. One person's food will be sufficient for two people. Two people's food will be sufficient for three people. This is how he motivated and inspired his uh, sahaba to those who had uh, like capacity to take some students from uh, Sufa and to host them, provide food for them and lots of other stories. But my point is we should understand those sahaba who is to reside in Al-Sufa, the number of these sahaba goes up and down. But approximately we can say the number was about 70. And these sahaba, they had actually quite many responsibilities. And I, I'd like to mention these four responsibilities that were outlined by Sheikh, uh, by Abdul Sattar al Sheikh. Abdul Sattar al Sheikh, an Arab scholar, good scholar, mashallah. He has a book called Tabaqatul Hufaz. Tabaqatul Hufaz. In the book, he mentions about the people of Sufa. And he says these Sufa students had four duties and responsibilities. Number one, Talaqi Sunan, to learn the practice and sunnah of Rasulullah to learn basically from Rasulullah. Second responsibility that they had was hirasatun nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to protect, like to guard Rasulullah from the enemies and all the stuff. The third responsibility that the Sahaba had is al khuruju ma'ahu fi kulli ghazati. Whenever Rasulullah goes uh, to, uh, for any expedition or anything, the Sahaba, uh, jihad and ghazwa, these Sahaba will be ready to participate in those jihad with Rasulullah. And the fourth responsibility that they had was Tanfizu Awamirihi Wahajati. Sometimes Rasulullah needs 
to send someone maybe to uh, Yemen, maybe to Bahrain, maybe to Oman or other places to collect zakat for other purposes. So these Sahaba, they will be dedicated, they are, they'll be ready for those uh, like jobs. Because other Sahaba, they had family, they have children and all other responsibilities. So they might not be able to do all this stuff as, as quick as the as Ahlu Sufa will be able. That's why these Sahaba, Ahlu Sufa, they were ready for this. Now from that, you can imagine how dedicated they were with Rasulullah. They were kind of always with Rasulullah. And anyone who has company of someone, obviously uh, company, suhba mu'athira. When you have company of someone, intentionally or unintentionally, that suhba, that company will have great impact on you. And it's normal, like, oh, I don't to give examples, so many examples can be given that when we be with something, when we are with something or someone, that person's impact and influence uh, is demonstrated on us in many ways. It, it has so much impact on us. So these Sahaba, they, they had actually impact or the barakah of the suhba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why they create kind of in themselves so much love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that might not be found in any other Sahaba perhaps. Or but it can be found in other Sahaba, but these Sahaba, they have special love. And maybe they, they had short company Maybe they were Muslims in uh, for four years, three years, two years. But because of that dedication of the Rasulullah, it makes up for all the other years. My brothers and sisters, if you are a student, you have known, you have studied a hadith called Hadith Jibril, long hadith. And we find Umar who says, I stayed for, for a few days. I didn't know who was that man. And then Rasulullah informed me after I came back, Rasulullah said, Haza Jibril. That was actually Jibril who came in a human form to me uh, to ask some questions so you can learn from this question and answer. Now, the point is that shows Umar radiallahu anhu great sahabi, Khalifatul Muslimin, but he didn't have the time or chance to actually come to Masjid an Nabawi every single day. And that's why you find narration in Bukhari even that Kanu Yantabu, they used to, they used to have turns. So today I will go to Rasulullah's Majlis. I will learn, and my neighbor, they will go to their firm lands and all the other places. They will be working in their lands. And in the evening, I will come back. I'll inform my neighbor, OK, today Rasulullah discussed these, these, this, and we learned this, this, this. Khalas. The next day, my neighbor will go to Rasulullah Majlis, and I will be working in my land. This is how they used to do, Kanu and Tabun. So therefore, Sahaba had their responsibility. And uh, Islam doesn't say just sit in the house and uh, just have tawakkul. No, Quran teaches the dua, Rabbana atina, fit dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasana, both of them, balance between deen and dunya. So Sahaba had their jobs and their responsibility, farms and business and all the stuff, but these dedicated Ahlu Sufa, they were always in the masjid ready to learn anything and everything from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Hurairah is amongst them. And love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, obviously it can be demonstrated and can be like mentioned in many ways. In fact, I will mention in upcoming uh, topics that whenever he would say a hadith, many a times, he would say, Awsani Khaliri. Abu Huraira would uh, start the hadith with this phrase, beautiful phrase, he would say, Awsani Khaliri. My friend advised me, insisted me to do this and that. So therefore, he would, re he would refer to Rasulullah as his Khalil, as his friend. And Khalil is not someone just, Khilal, you see, in Udu, we say Khilal. Khilal means passing the fingers of one hand to another, very like uh, integrated and close. So he says, Khalili, I was very close to Rasulullah. And that's enough. And you see, Rasulullah, uh, Abu Huda's entire life was dedicated to actually uh, pass on the legacy and uloom of Rasulullah to the Ummah. So I don't need much uh, evidence to say in this case. Governor of Bahrain. <clears throat> This is something that Rasulullah actually um, sent to uh, Rasul, uh, sent Abu Huraira to Bahrain. And obviously, we can't actually say Bahrain exactly the way it is now in the map. It can, it can be in different way. Maybe it was wider than this uh, different uh, thing. But point is, Rasulullah sent him all the way to Bahrain. And at that time, Rasulullah said, and this mentioned by one of the earliest 
Islamic historian, Muslim history, historian, whose name is Ibn Sa'd. His book called Tabaqat, which is well known and well appreciated by Muslims. Anyone who wants to write history, they will refer to that book. Uh, they need to refer to that book. It's called Tabaqatu Ibn Sa'd, at tabaqatul Kubra or at tabaqatul Kabir. Both of them are fine. So in that book, we, we find the information that Rasulullah sent Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, older to Bahrain. The purpose was to collect zakat and to, touch, uh, to teach these people, like to teach them about Islam, etc. This is very simple information. You might think, oh, why do you need to learn this? Okay, we, we can learn actually many things about his travel to Bahrain and stuff, but my point for which we need to remember here in this information is that Rasulullah is a Rasul, he's a messenger of Allah. Secondly, he's the head of the Islamic State, of the Islamic Khilafah. Now, as a Rasul and as his head of the Islamic State, when Rasulullah sends someone to somewhere for any uh, obligation, for any job or anything, then that itself a proof that Rasulullah has trust on this person. How can a prime minister, how can a president, uh, can a president or prime minister will send anyone and everyone for any reason? No, they will choose the person. They will choose a, a, an appropriate person who is uh, suitable for that job. So that shows when Rasulullah sent Abu Huraira, who all the way to Bahrain as a governor and zakat collector and as a teacher, this shows that Rasulullah had trust on Abu Huraira. And if he didn't have trust, then uh, how can he send Abu Huraira all the way to Bahrain? So that shows the trust of Rasulullah. The second information here that we should also remember is very small information, but it's important, is that Hajj was actually prescribed upon Muslim Ummah, upon Muslims. There are many opinions, but according to the majority opinion, or one of the strongest opinion is in eight Hijri year. But the second, the next one, next year was ninth Hijri year. But Islam didn't go for Hajj in that year for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons was that Makkah and Quraysh, they would come to do Hajj and all the Jahiliya people, they would come to do Hajj. Sometimes, uh, no, like their customers, Uriana, naked. They would have uh, like uh, small idols on their armpit or like hiding and all the other stuff they would do. So Rasulullah didn't want to go in that year because if he goes and also Mushrik comes, like Mushrikun come to do Hajj, then as if, they are all going to do Hajj with the Baytullah. Some of them will be naked. The Mushrik will be naked. And that, that's the, the environment is not actually nice. So it's not okay. Let me not go for this year. And you go. So he sent some service. He said, you go and make announcement from next year. None of the naked people will be allowed to do Hajj and all the stuff. So this is actually a great lesson that we shouldn't go to anywhere and everywhere where the environment is actually not appropriate. We should, before we go to anywhere, even it's Ibadah perhaps, maybe marriage, obviously marriage, uh, et etc. These are very good occasions. We should participate if we can. But before going to those uh, occasions, we actually need to make sure that is, if the environment is okay for me. Okay, so Islam didn't go in the ninth year to Hajj. He sent a group of Sahaba. This can be mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, this can be found in Bukhari and in Muslim and many other books of Hadith. <clears throat> Amongst this group were Abu Bakr, Ali, and Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhum. Now, this is a proof again that Rasulullah trust these Sahaba. That's why he sent them to Mecca all the way to make announcements on behalf of Rasulullah that next year, none of the mushrik will be allowed to do Hajj and none of the naked person will be allowed to come next to the Kaaba. And moreover, we find that on the day of Nahar, meaning uh, 10th of Zulhijjah, which is Qurbani day, and which is actually Yawm al Hajj al Akbar, the big day for Hajj, we have lots of activities to do on that day in Hajj. So, therefore, on that day, Rasulullah, I mean Abu Bakr, obviously Abu Bakr was the head of this group. So, Abu Bakr appoints some Sahaba. He said, Okay, you go to Mina, you go to Muzdalifa, you go to this junction, that corner, this uh, meeting point. He sends some Sahaba to different places, meeting points, to make this announcement. And Abu Bakr who chose Abu Hurad who to go to Mina. And Mina will be very crowded on that day because people need to do uh, uh, Ramul Jimar and all the stuff. So that shows 
that Abu Bakr also had great trust on Abu Hurairah. Otherwise, how can he send Abu, Abu Hurairah to that big crowd and where actually we need someone very strong and very uh, trustworthy person to pass on this information. So in that journey of Hajj, 93 year, we got two points. Rasulullah trusted Abu Huraira along other Sahaba. Secondly, Abu Bakr trusted Abu Huraira to make this announcement in Mina. So all these shows uh, show that Rasulullah and Sahaba, all of them, they were confident about Abu Huraira. They had no issue about Abu Huraira's trustworthiness or his personality. <clears throat> if we understand this point, then I'm sure we got this idea that Sahabi Abu Huraira was very close to Rasulullah. He was a trustworthy person to Rasulullah and Rasulullah loved him. Rasulullah loved his family, like his mother as well. Rasulullah made dua for him. And in fact, Abu Huraira's entire personality or his acceptance of Islam was actually as a consequence of Rasulullah's dua. Now, <clears throat> what happens after Rasulullah leave leaves this dunya after Islam has left the world, what does Abu Huraira do? That he just uh, get along with his life and start getting married and all the stuff. What does he do? Even though getting married itself is a good thing in Islam, it is, it is uh, encouraged and motivated. People should get married. And if you remember, my brothers and sisters, Abu Huraira, when he came to Rasulullah's khidmah in the seventh Hijri year, when he came to Medina, he was about 30 years old. So now, when Rasulullah leaves the dunya, he's 34, 35 years old. Still not that like uh, aged. And <clears throat> when a person is young, they, they have obviously much uh, more uh, ability to recall things, to memorize things. From the last section, we also learned that Abu Huraira was kind of homeless. Abu Huraira kind of was jobless as well. He didn't have any job. He didn't have anything to go, think about, worry about. He didn't have any family member to think about. So he was completely free to learn from Rasulullah. Now, after Rasulullah leaves the dunya, he uh, engages himself in actually teaching and preaching. He starts teaching, uh, teaching hadith and narrating this hadith uh, that he learned, he acquired from Rasulullah to the Sahaba. Now, when we speak about Abu Huraira's teaching, we should actually, we should speak about a few things here. <clears throat> Number one, we'll be looking at his students. Number two, we'll be looking at uh, the places where he used to teach. And also we'll be looking at uh, some documentary, some documents that were gathered or collected from his like lessons and stuff like that. And also, we'll be talking about his method of teaching as we find in the next point. So let's talk about the students who learned from Abu Hurairah. We find Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, who was a like uh, intelligent man in Islamic history. Bukhari has a book called at tarikhul Kabir, along other books. In that book, he confirms, Bukhari confirms through his own research, and Bukhari traveled more than 16,000 kilometers, you can imagine. Obviously, it's not a, a, we are talking about plane journeys, which is quite comfortable and easy. We're talking about journeys, uh, uh, payadol journey, meaning martian, on the foot. We're talking about journeys on the camel, and camel journey is not easy, and, uh, or, or, or uh, horse, which is tiring and uh, time consuming. And those times, so Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, he gathered lots of ilim through these travels, all these uh, across the globe, Islamic uh, um, countries. Imam Bukhari finds out through his own studies that Abu Huraira, if we talk about his students, then he says about 800 students learned from Abu Huraira. And my brother and sister, when we're talking about students, we don't mean random people just listen to someone's lecture. Obviously, Abu Huraira used to give bayan and lectures in masjid, and we're not including these people. People come to motivational speech and they go. We are talking about those students who learned from him, and then they carried on this legacy to other people. 
So that's why we know them because if they didn't learn anything or if they didn't pass on anything to us, how do we know they were students of Abu, Abu Huraira or not? So therefore it doesn't mean Abu Huraira only had 80, 800 people around him, no. Thousands of people benefited from Abu Huraira, but 800 were prominent kind of great students who actually learned and also then conveyed this ilm from Abu Huraira. And obviously I'm not going to mention all the names here and the time will not allow me to mention all the names, but I would like to actually mention a few students' names that if you are a student of Hadith and if you read any book of Hadith like Bukhari, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawud, or any book, you'll find these students are reporting from Abu Huraira most Hadith. So <clears throat> if we say those students who reported many Hadith from them, from Abu Huraira, then we can actually outline a few names. For example, you can say, Saeed ibn al-Musayyab, a prominent tabi'i who wasn't a student of Abu Huraira only, but he, was, he learned from many other Sahaba, and he was considered to be one of the greatest mufti of Medina. You can imagine, Saeed al-Musayyab tabi'i, and he was very close to Abu Huraira and who, and we learned that Abu Huraira who was so happy about Saeed al-Musayyab, his student, and he was very satisfied about the progress of his student Saeed ibn Musayyab. Later on, Abu Huraira chose to, like decided to marry his daughter, like Abu Huraira's daughter to Saeed ibn Musayyab. So at the end, Saeed ibn Musayyab becomes son-in-law for Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. But obviously we're not talking about this because Abu Huraira is not married yet. He, did, he doesn't get married yet at this point. Uh, after some straight away. <clears throat> so, and then we have another student who's very well known as well, Muhammad bin Sirin. Even uh, general Muslims also know about his name because Muhammad bin Sirin was an expert of uh, ex interpreting dream. Like he used to interpret dreams and people refer to him a lot. Another student that had narrated lots of hadith from Abu Huraira, it's called Abu Saleh. So we got three names. I mentioned three names and I'll mention one more name, but there are lots of students. An amazing thing is, if you look at these students, then you'll see there's a book called Difa'un an Abi Huraira, which gathered, mashallah, lots of information about Abu Huraira. In that book, you will find, he categorized the students of Abu Huraira. And he says, amongst the students of Abu Huraira, there were actually a great number of Qadi, a great number of judges of that time. So from that, you can imagine that all the judges coming from different parts of the world, all there to Medina to learn from Abu Huraira. Why would they come to Abu Huraira to learn? Because they know that if we go to Abu Huraira, we can learn and we can actually implement these ahkam and these rulings when we uh, decide, when we make decisions in our areas. So obviously we need to go through this very briefly. We're already one hour is gone. So I just mentioned three students' name. And if you check Muslim especially or Bukhari or any book, you'll find these students' names come very often. Saeed ibn al-Musayyab, Muhammad ibn Sirin, Abu Saleh also, Zakwan as Samman, his name. Abu Saleh, his name is Zakwan as Samman. But the fourth student I will mention in a minute, inshallah. Now, <clears throat> these are the Tabi'in. But amazingly, Abu Huraira was so well acknowledged by the ulama of that time, by the students of that time, that not only the Tabi'in, but Sahaba even used to come, even used to come to learn from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. And I can mention a list of Sahaba who reported hadith from Abu Huraira. And their hadith can be located in the well-known six books, as well as many other hadith collections. I don't need to give an example. If you just open any book, you'll see many examples that Sahaba even reporting hadith from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. Let me just mention a few names that I gathered. So, and I just mentioned few names only. Sahabi Zaid ibn Sabit, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Umar, Abdullah Ibn Zubair, Jabir Ibn Abdullah, uh, Ubay Ibn Kaab, Aisha Umm al Mu'minin, Abu Musa al Ash'ari, Anas Ibn Malik. And you can imagine Anas Ibn Malik who accompanied Rasulullah for 10 years. The time when Rasulullah came to Medina, uh, Anas Mam Umm Sulaim brought him to Rasulullah. And from that time till Rasulullah left the world, left this dunya, 
Anas was in his company. So Anas would know about Rasam's more secrets and everything. So Anas also trusts Abu Huraira the alone. He, he knows that Rasulullah was happy with Abu Huraira. That's why Anas, Rasulullah's Khadim, Rasulullah's like a very close person, he also trusts Abu Huraira and he learns from Abu Huraira. So these are the Sahaba and their narrations are recorded with uh, Sahih Sanad. And obviously if someone doesn't, uh, so there are, it's interesting to mention that some people, if you uh, say that, okay, this information can be found in Bukhari, for instance, or in Tirmidhi, for instance, they say, oh, no, we don't believe in Hadith, or we don't find it uh, like reliable sources. But it's interesting, the same people, they rely on history. So why don't you uh, take information from Hadith? Hadith is history as well. That's why Allama Manazir Ahsan Gilani, mashallah, one of the uh, prominent students of Imam Anwar Shah Kashmiri. His name is Manazir Ahsan Gilani, who studied in madrasa settings, as well as university, like formal uh, educational setting as well. And Manazir Hassan Gilani has a book called Tadweenul Hadith, which is actually written in Urdu, then it was translated by Allama uh, Abdurazak Iskander into Arabic, and our Sheikh Dr. Bashar Maruf uh, edited it in Arabic as well. It's called Tadweenul Hadith, printed by uh, Darul Gharb from Tunisia. So in that book, Maulana Manazir Hassan Gilani Rahimahullah says, oh, if you don't, if you can understand the concept of hadith, just understand this, that hadith is actually a historical document of Rasulullah's life. So those people who cannot take hadith into consideration, but they can take history into consideration, they should consider hadith as history. In fact, it's better history than uh, a history because in history, you don't have no son or anything. You have nothing. You just read, maybe some, person, some people wrote it and you just trust them. That's it. This is called history. So history includes all the good and bad, all the false and true information. Whereas hadith were hadith has very uh, like technical terms and all the stuff, science, ulumul hadith, etc., which verify the authenticity of the hadith, which you don't find in history. In fact, our Sheikh Dr. Bashar Bashar Maruf Hafizahullah, in one occasion, in Al Furqan Institute in London, in Al Furqan in, in central London. In 2019, he, he was giving a lecture, mashallah. And Bashar Maruf is his, in his 90s now, mashallah. He's from Iraq, but lives in Jordan. So Sheikh says that, and he traveled uh, to Germany. He studied in Germany and many other countries. He's a Muslim scholar, but he's an expert of Arabic manuscripts. So for the manuscript purpose, he traveled to Holland, Germany, UK. And he used to come to UK in 1970s when they used to, uh, he said, I used to spend the whole day just with a sandwich. And I used to buy a sandwich only for 50, 60 piece. <laughs> you can imagine for that time. That was enough for me. The whole day is enough. So Sheikh Bashar al Maruf says that once he was talking to an Orientalist, and the Orientalist, uh, he mentioned the name as well, in Germany, in some of the libraries of Germany. And Bashar al Maruf says that that German historian scholar, like a scholar of history, he confirmed to me that, you know, Today we have principles or rules how to verify historical information. We actually collected this information from Islamic ulum al-hadith. We have a science called ulum al-hadith which kind of uh, categorize the hadith into sahih, da'if, hasan, and talks about the rabbis and all the stuff. So it's interesting, you, you don't believe in hadith and you say hadith is kind of uh, unauthentic in your opinion or unreliable sources, but you, you believe in history. You take information from history. Anyway, I was saying, that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he had students, not just tabi'i, but also sahaba. They also trusted him. They also learned from him. And where he used to teach them? He used to teach actually in Masjid an nabawi You find in the history book, like in, uh, in uh, Allama Shamsuddin al-Zahabi's book, uh, Siyaru Alam al-Nubala, that at some point, Masjid an nabawi like there would be, Thousands of people attending Abu Huraira's lesson, and his lesson would be regular lesson in Masjid An Nabawi in the presence of greatest Sahaba, including Umar and all the Sahaba. Only for a short period of time, the lessons, all the lessons, Abu Huraira's lesson as well as all the other Sahaba's lesson were uh, paused. Now it is uh, we have seen in our time, Corona made lots of things to be terminated for 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 a period of time. Similarly, at some point there was some issues. 
and I'm not going to talk about those things at this point, but for some reason, there are some uh, issues for which Umar then said, okay, for this period of time, we will pause our lessons in Masjid al-Nabawi. So that was paused for a few months, and then again it started. And again, guess what? The same teacher, Abu Hurairah. Then. Umar then said, oh, Abu, we don't uh, find Abu Hurairah as a good teacher or something, so let's make, a, uh, let's make another teacher. No, same teacher, Abu Hurairah, who, and he taught there until he died, until he left this world. And that was quite a long time. My brothers and sisters, if you remember, Rasulullah Sallam left this world in 11th Hijri, in the month of Rabi'ul Awal, 11th Hijri. So from that time, after this time, he started teaching and he'll be teaching until he dies. And he dies in 57 Hijri, 57th Hijri. So can you imagine? It's, it's uh, 40 years almost he's teaching in Masjid an Nabawi. Almost 40 years. Uh, more, more than 40 years, actually, is teaching in, in Masjid an nabawi And you can imagine how many students would he have in that place. So please remember these few points that we are talking, his dedication, now long-term teaching, long, like, teaching time. And now, before we move on to the next point, we are going to say about a written document of Abu Huraira's teaching, <clears throat> which is called Sahifa Hammam ibn Munabbi. So Ibn Hammam ibn Munabbi, subhanAllah, it's one of the earliest written documentary of hadith that survived. It was actually uh, combined like this. Uh, so Ibn Hammam ibn Munabbi, Hammam ibn Munabbi is a student of Abu Huraira. And the interesting thing is, Hammam ibn Munabbi comes from the same area as Abu Huraira, which is Yemen, Daus. And at some point, Hammam ibn Munabi came to Abu Hurairah and made a request that, Ustaz, I learned from you so many hadith in the majlis, in the lessons and all the stuff, but can you, as I am from your own local area, meaning I am from Yemen as well, so can you give me some nasiha or advice? And look at Abu Hurairah, the wisdom and the hikmah that he had in his teaching. So Abu Hurairah looks at Hammam, he, he accepts the request, and he teaches Hammam in the same majlis he teaches Hammam, Hammam about uh, more than 70 hadith. Like, I think about 100, you can say 100 hadith. He teaches Hammam ibn Munabbi. And look at this. Abu Huraira choose only those hadith which are kind of, uh, like, which talk about moral conducts, adab, akhlaq, and all the stuff. Hammam ibn Munabbi, his student from Abu Huraira's local area, he, young man, comes to Abu Huraira, and Abu Huraira choose these hadith which can actually beautify Hammam ibn Munabbi as a young man, his action, his akhlaq, his amal, and the stuff. That's why Abu Hurairah chose this hadith. He doesn't mention any uh, fiqhi mas'ala, any ja'iz, na'jaiz mas'ala. Rather, he chose those hadith which is more so about akhlaq and adab, behavior, mannerism, etc. Adab. So that shows Abu Hurairah was a very uh, intelligent man. He knows to teach what to which person. And mashallah, this, uh, the hadith that Hammam ibn Munabbi learned, he made notes in the same majlis. He wrote it down. He wrote all these hadiths down. And then this, this survived long time. And this copy or the actual hundred copy was so well circulated and it was copied by many people. Like lots of people uh, copied that uh, sahifa, that scripture. And we find that even in our, till our time, two of the hundred and copies of Sahifa Hammam ibn Munabbi, they survived. Sheikh Muhammad Hamidullah, I spoke about him uh, you know, a bit earlier. He, mashallah, gathered these two copies, hundred and copies, ancient, old, hundred and copies. One was from Al Maktabatu Zahiriya, from Damascus, from Dimash. And another copy was from Germany. So he gathered these two copies. 100 copies, ancient copies, and then he edits them, he like gets them uh, published, which was published actually in 1952 or 53 during that time. And mashallah Hamidullah wrote a detailed introduction to that Sahifa. I would ask anyone who is interested in reading Arabic and they, they are familiar with Arabic, they should actually download that book at least. Sahifa Hammam ibn Munabbi, and they should read the Muqaddima with taking time and try to observe the lessons that we can derive from this Muqaddima. Okay, so that's a written documentary of Abu Huraira's teaching career. Career, like the, the, he taught he taught students, 
and the ilim that he taught them survived even in written form, not just verbally, not just oral uh, transmission. Obviously, I'm mentioning this thing very briefly, but let's move on. Uh, the second thing is method of narrating hadith. Uh, we can mention lots of things that Abu Huraira had method, like in terms of teaching. One of the method is that Abu Huraira, whose teaching was very vast. My brothers and sisters, if you read hadith, and I, I, I recommend this to my students, mashallah, in Madani, in Quatr Islam, I do that. Sometimes I ask them, okay, can you just look at this bab and can you find out which Sahabi reported the hadith of this bab most? And I did that in Madani as well this year in Tirmizi. We choose, I think, Kitab al and I said to the students, okay, find out who, who, like, who are those Sahaba who reported a hadith about food from Rasulullah. And then in Kuwait Islam, we did the same thing as well. I think we did that about Kitab al maybe, that we tried, out, we tried to find out, and students did that, mashallah, which Sahabi reported a hadith of this chapter. So you will find that some Sahabi, they reported a hadith of only one chapter. Maybe they were involved in teaching with this topic. Like some Sahabi, you see, they are reporting only hadith about Hajj. Some Sahabi only reporting hadith about Tahara purification. Some Sahabi only reporting hadith about uh, transaction, Buyur. Some Sahabi are reporting hadith only about Nikah. So you see this kind of speciality. Some Sahabi are being special in a in, uh, few uh, uh, you know, discipline and few fields. But it's interesting to find out that Abu Hurairah, who his teaching was so wide and vast. He was kind of an encyclopedia. He had encyclopedic knowledge. That's why go to any hadith collection and open any chapter, be it related to purification or uh, transaction or family life, marriage, and all the other stuff, Islamic, you know, code and all the stuff. You see, there are hadith recorded by Abu Hurairah. So this is amazing thing about Abu Hurairah, that he wasn't only special of one thing, rather his knowledge was very vast and he was he had encyclopedic knowledge of all the uh, relevant topics the second thing that we learn we find out from abu hurairah's method of teaching is that it is mentioned in some sources like siyar al anbiya etc that many a times abu hurairah would start the lesson he would start the lesson of hadith with this hadith man kadaba alayya muta'ammidan which is one of the mutawatir hadith, a hadith which has been transmitted unanimously by many sahaba, you can't even count them perhaps, and many tabi'in and, and so on. Like there is no doubt about it. So in this hadith, uh, the hadith says, Man mutaammidan, anyone who makes lies against me. Like Rasulullah is saying, anyone who attributes something false to me. I didn't say that, but he said, oh, Rasulullah said that. I didn't do that, but they say, oh, Rasulullah did that. So anyone does that, lay him like his place in Jahannam. He is going to go to Jahannam without any sort of uh, you know, argument. So now, why would Abu Huraira choose this hadith to say before he starts the lesson? For two reasons. Number one, to remind himself and to give confidence to the audience that I am very cautious about what I'm going to say. So listen carefully because I'm, I'm, I'm reminding myself that I should not add any single word from me when I'm reporting hadith. So it's a good reminder for himself and for everyone. Second, lesson, second reason for which you do that is that Abu Hurairah who wants his, teach, his students to, uh, he wants to warn his students. You are lots of students here, hundreds of students are gathering here, and you're learning from me. You are coming from Yemen, from Bahrain, from Syria, from Baghdad, from Kufa. You'll go back to your areas. Don't make things up. You learn from me, learn carefully. And remember, Rasulullah said, if you make things against him, if you say things wrong against him, I mean, if you attribute things wrong to him, you'll go to Jahannam. So therefore, he's reminding his students, warning them, because you all are not from Medina. If you are from Medina, fair enough. I, I'm in Medina. I can encounter you. I can correct your uh, mistakes if you made mistakes. But obviously, you'll go to other places. So be careful. Don't do that. So he was teaching and he was warning his students. So that shows Abu Hurairah was very careful. How could you say Abu Hurairah was, wasn't that careful about his narration? The third <clears throat> method that I can mention is Abu Hurairah, he would sometimes say the hadith, Qala Khalili. Or Khalili, this kind of stuff. Like he would 
refer to Rasulullah, not just as Rasulullah, as well, like this, rather he would say, my friends, my friend. So basically he's, he shows his love and his uh, care for Rasulullah and stuff. In terms of teaching, sometimes Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, what do you do? He, instead of just reporting the hadith, just saying the words of hadith, he would make an introduction. He will say something before it, so people can pay attention to him, and then he will mention the hadith. So uh, it's like, instead of just quoting hadith, he will explain the hadith beforehand, and then he will quote the exact words of hadith. Uh, I see it's now already 6.20, and obviously the time will not allow me to go all through all this stuff, but we see this. We see that Abu Radhan who would do that, sometimes he would say, in one occasion, it, the hadith is recorded in Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal, one of the great uh, collections. In that he says, Ahsinul wudu'a. People, you should do wudu very uh, carefully, like you should make your wudu perfect, and you should do nice wudu, nicely and perfectly. Yarhamukumullah, may Allah have mercy on you. So Ahsinul wudu'a, yarhamukumullah. And then he says, Alam tasma'u ma qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So first he says things from himself that he commands or he instructs something and then he quotes hadith as an evidence. This was his own uh, method of uh, reporting hadith. Another method, method was sometimes he would say the hadith first and then he would add something after the hadith to explain the hadith. And Abu Huraira would say, Hada min kisi. don't get mixed, don't get mixed, messed up or confused. The hadith is the first part and then what I've just mentioned to you now, it's from myself, meaning I said this to you in order to interpret the hadith or in order to explain the hadith. So Abu Hurairah, who was very uh, careful when he's teaching hadith, and he would say, if you add anything to the hadith as an explanation or interpretation, he would mention it separately. Don't worry, this is not hadith. It's actually separate part. <clears throat> Sometimes he, he would go even to markets in order to encourage people about uh, learning, he, like to teach them. So that was one of his methods that he would encourage people to learn, to study. He's not just a, a, just a dry teacher, just comes to the lesson and just goes on. No, he actually motivates students. This was, that was his method. And I don't have time to actually go through all the other methods, but I think that's fine. For us to, but one more thing, sometimes he wouldn't just say the words, rather he would show it, he would demonstrate the sunnah, the act of Rasulullah to the Sahaba, I mean to the students. In Sahih Muslim we find, and in other books as well, about Salah. He says, Inni la ashbahukum salatan bi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He doesn't teach his students, okay, Salah is just to do this, to do that. No, sometimes he demonstrates, he shows them. So also like visual teaching what we see in our time. So Abu Radhan would uh, follow that kind of method, teaching method as well. <clears throat> Let's move on. So the next one, Abu Huraira as a Quran recited. There are lots of information, but just for us to remember that there are two qiraat that we have, mutawatir qiraat and well-known qiraat. One is called qiraat of Warsh, another is called qiraat of Qalun. These two qiraat, they actually go through the Sanad of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. If you look at the Sanad, and I have Sanad copies as well with me, like from Morocco and other countries. These Sanad, if you look at the Sanad, you, you see that in the Sanad, you have Abu Huraira's name, meaning he's part of the chain of narration of Qiraat as well. So Abu Huraira is not just a narrator of Hadith, but also he's a reciter of the Quran, and he is one of the transmitters, like Qari of the Quran. Now, if you actually accuse Abu Huraira in a wrong way, that is actually you're accusing the Quran. That's why defending Abu Huraira is defending Sunnah. Defending Abu Huraira is actually defending the Quran. Because if you say Abu Huraira wasn't uh, reliable, then that means Quran is not reliable because Quran, the transmitters who transmitted the Qiraat, the method of reading of Quran, was one of them was Abu, Abu Huraira. That's why we shouldn't get. Uh, confused and we shouldn't be fooled with those people who say, oh, we believe in the Quran. We, Quran, we take Quran as an evidence and we don't believe in Hadith because Hadith is not well preserved and so on. But in reality, these people are actually, what are saying? They are saying 
they are trying to disconnect Muslims from Quran, uh, from Hadith. So if they are disconnected from Hadith, then they will have nothing to refer back. So they will go to Quran, they will translate it, they will interpret it that way they wish. And it's easy to make, uh, they make them, miss, uh, you know, to, uh, take them to wrong directions. One of the person who just visited UK a few, uh, maybe last month or something, he, he was asked this question, like, the way you interpret Quran, it doesn't like match with any tafsir or any earlier explanation of the Quran, hadith and all the stuff. He said, oh no, everyone has right to interpret the Quran the way they wish. And my brother and sister, you can imagine the damage that you, uh, these people will cause if they allow everyone and anyone to translate the Quran and interpret the way they wish. That will be there. Nothing will remain from Quran. Nothing will remain. So obviously they can't say we don't believe in Quran. If, the, if they say we don't believe in Quran, we'll say, okay, fair enough. If you don't believe in Quran, we regard you as non-Muslims and you don't have any authority to speak about Quran and Hadith then, unless you become Muslim. But if they say we are Muslim and we believe in Quran, then obviously they kind of go into the fold of Islam. Now they say, oh, we don't believe in Hadith, we just believe in Quran. So by saying that actually in a nice way, they're trying to disconnect us from the Quran itself. Anyway, so <clears throat> these people who say Abu Huraira wasn't translated, they now, they don't believe in Quran then, or they believe Quran is actually uh, not transmitted well then. Okay. The next point is, as a faqi, as a faqi and mufti, Abu Huraira was actually a faqi. If you go to uh, Sahaba's time, you will see Sahaba used to actually refer the questioners to Abu Huraira. And I'll give you only one example at this point today. It is recorded in hadith collections from Ibn Abbas, Abdullah Ibn Abbas, a prominent Sahabi, the cousin brother of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's recorded that in one occasion, Ibn Abbas was asked a question about talaq, about talaq of a woman and stuff like this. And the information that I'm telling you, my brother and sister, it's from Mu'atta Malik one of the most authentic hadith collections. It says that Abu Huraira, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, <clears throat> and Abu Huraira, they were together in the same place. And someone uh, came and asked the question. Now look at Ibn Abbas. He says, Afti ya Abu Huraira. Wa Abu Huraira, you give fatwa. Afti is like from ifta, like from the root letters. So now look at Ibn Abbas, the cousin brother of Rasulullah sallam, he is not giving fatwa in front of Abu Huraira. Rather, he's relating, he's referring the questioner to Abu Huraira and says, oh, Abu Huraira, you give the fatwa. So that means Abu Huraira wasn't just a dry muhaddith or something. Rather, he was actually a mufti. He knew, he knew how to uh, like uh, implement hadith and how to take hadith and how to derive lessons from the hadith for Muslim lives. This is really important. And that's why in Islamic history, all the ulama, when they write biography of Abu Huraira, they write Abu Huraira was a faqih and mufti. You go to uh, Shamsuddin al-Zahabi's kitab or any other books, you will see, they say al-faqih, al-mufti, al-mujtahid, all the stuff they add. So we all believe, ulama say that yes, Abu Huraira was a faqih. But the problem is uh, in a book that is called Nurul Anwar and some Hanafi books later on, they kind of, in a discussion, they kind of hinted that Abu Huraira wasn't, yes, he was a great muhaddith, and his main field was hadith, so he wasn't into fiqh. So they kind of consider Abu Huraira as non faqih muhaddith. No one had issue about his hadith. Obviously, he's a, he's a master of hadith. But some people, they just said, oh, Abu Huraira's main field was fiqh, uh, hadith, not fiqh. But this is not actually the uh, true stance of Hanafi ulama. If you look at books, and I can refer you to some books, for example, <clears throat> We have Allama Ibn al Humam in Fathul Qadir. He confirmed that Abu Huraira huwa faqihun. And Ibn al Humam is one of the masters of Hanafi fiqh. And he confirmed that Abu Huraira was faqih. So there is no issue from Hanafi fiqh as well. All the Hanafi ulama, majority, uh, the, the reliable one, they also consider Abu Huraira as faqih. If you go to a book called Kashful Asrar, written by Allama Abdul Aziz al-Bukhari, which is a shara of Usul al-Bazdawi. In that kitab you find, Abdul Aziz al-Bukhari also considers Abu Huraira as faqih, mufti sahabi. And finally, I would like to quote Allama Anwar Shah Kashmiri. 
one of the recent, like from the last century, one of the greatest fuqaha and ulama of our time, not just for uh, subcontinent India, but also for the entire Muslim world. Uh, ulama scholars from different backgrounds would even re uh, respect and appreciate Allama Kashmiri's ulum. So Allama Kashmiri in his Faidul Bari, it is also mentioned that yes, anyone who tries to say Abu Hurairah wasn't faqih, that person is wrong actually. How can you say Abu Hurairah wasn't faqih? He was a prominent faqih of the time as well. Okay, let's move on. Marriage and family life. Abu Hurairah anhu, at some point after he, uh, after Rasulullah left the world, he gets married. And it's amazing to see that when Abu Hurairah who gets married, he actually gets married to another Sahabi. Her name is Busra bin Ghazwan. Busra bin Ghazwan. And Busra bin Ghazwan, her family was Sahaba, like family, brothers and sisters were Sahaba and Sahabi. Yet, entire family was a respected family, noble family in Medina. So this marriage itself says everything. That Abu Huraira was really respected in the Sahaba community, even though he was a homeless man, perhaps. He was a jobless man. He's a migrant, but still, uh, Sahabiya Busra bin Tegazwan, radiallahu anha, she's getting married to her, and the family are agreeing and uh, celebrating and uh, like happy with this marriage. That means Abu Huraira was actually well appreciated in the community of Sahaba. They all looked up for Abu Huraira. Gee. And then, obviously, Abu Hurairah later on, actually, he gets involved in business as well. He does business, all the stuff. So, like, he doesn't rely on people only. Rather, he does it himself. That's a different discussion. But after getting married, he uh, has children as well. We can mention Fuchin's name. Like, one of his, uh, one of his son's name is Muharrar. Another son's name is Abdurrahman. Another son's name is Bilal. They all are good people. They all reported hadith from Abu Hurairah. But amazingly, we see they, they didn't play that much of role in this narrating, uh, narration procedure. And they're actually good. The, no one can claim, oh, look, the sons are reporting from the father. Maybe it's just, they're just, it's just family business. No. Obviously, even if it was family, we could have said that was another way it's good because that means that shows Abu Huraira uh, trained his family in a way that they were involved with him in teaching and preaching. But from uh, to avoid that accusation, we see it's good that the son they didn't narrate many hadith. Rather, outsider Muhammad bin Sirin, uh, Abu Salih Zakwan, and all the other people from different lands, not just from Medina itself, different countries, they are coming and learning hadith from him. That's actually a plus point about Abu Radhan who's teaching. <clears throat> now, uh, one daughter he had, and who was known as Umm Habib. Umm Habib, the mother of Habib, obviously at that time they would use more kunya. So Umm Habib, the mother of Habib. Umm Habib was married to Sayyid ibn al-Musayyab, as I indicated earlier. So Sayyid ibn al-Musayyab, radiallahu anhu, this prominent Sahabi, he was a uh, faqih, mufti of Medina and muhaddis, and he was a son-in-law for Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. Okay. <clears throat> now, as you see, the last point in this page is Sahaba praised him. I don't, I don't have much, I, I need to go to the next point, it's more important, but let me mention only three statements. Number one, the first one is the statement made by Sahabi Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar and a narrator of Hadith and Faqih and great uh, like Sahabi of his time. It is recorded that Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said to Abu Huraira and recorded by Ibn Umar. Ibn Umar record this hadith that I said to Abu Huraira in one occasion that look, Ya Abu Huraira, wa Abu Huraira, anta kunta al zamana. You are actually most dedicated student of Rasulullah. Anta kunta al zamana li Rasulullah sallam. This great Sahabi Ibn Umar admits that you are the most alzam, most dedicated student to Rasulullah sallam. And you memorize, you remember most of his hadith, like you are the most prominent students of Rasulullah. So this narration is not made, this statement is not made by Abu Huraira. It's made by Ibn Umar in a book, like in Hadith collection, Tirmizi. This is Sahih Sanad, I checked him. So uh, that means Sahaba praising him. The second Sahabi that I'd like to mention is Ibn Abbas. And I already indicated to that. That Ibn Abbas said, Afti ya Abu He's not giving fatwa by himself, 
Brother Ibn Abbas is relying on Abu Huraira. That shows Sahabi Ibn Abbas had this trustworthiness on Abu Huraira, the trust on Abu Huraira. And the third one that I'd like to mention in this case, the final one, is the recorded by Talha Ibn Ubaidullah. And long hadith, again in Tirmizi. All these three that I mentioned to you, uh, to you now, all of them are in Tirmizi. So in uh, Talha Ibn Ubaidullah, he says that, لا أشك أنه سمع من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما لم نسمع. Obviously, some people they were kind of jealous at that time from Tabi, not from Sahaba. Sahaba they were obviously uh, welcoming Abu Hurairah. Outside of Sahaba, some people they say, "Oh, Abu Hurairah who reports so many hadiths, none of the other Sahaba does the same way." So he came. To, he came to Talha ibn Ubaidullah, one of the great Sahaba of Rasulullah. Talha ibn Ubaidullah says, oh, why would you have doubt about it? As a Sahabi, I have no doubt. And I believe that Abu Hurairah had lots of things that I we didn't, we didn't hear from Rasulullah. Meaning he was always with Rasulullah. So he got to learn more from Rasulullah that we didn't get. We didn't get the opportunity and the option. So therefore, therefore, Talha ibn Ubaidullah also praising Abu Huraira and accepting that it's not only uh, like Saha, Abu Huraira himself, but all the other Sahaba are accepting that Abu Huraira is actually most knowledgeable or uh, most engaged in narrating hadith. If we talk about uh, the accusations, we actually have two pages to talk about, but I think maybe we can just do one page for here. <clears throat> Number one is the number of narrations and the reality of this number. This is the main point. If you, if all the other questions are nothing compared to this question, the way they, they pose and the way they present this question, some people nowadays, the um, Quranists who believe that we only follow Quran and no Hadith, uh, and those people who call themselves as feminists, those, call, those people who call themselves as modernists, those people who call themselves as like Mustashikun, those who are Orientalist scholars, and also Shias, these five group of people, they have kind of few questions against the Sahabi Abu Radhan, and it's pretty much normal. We don't blame them for these accusations because uh, their agenda or their main purpose is to deny the Sunnah, to deny the Hadith of Rasulullah. And if you want to deny the Hadith of Rasulullah, then obviously the gateway to Hadith is Abu Huraira. So if you can make him unreliable, then obviously the entire Hadith literature collapse. That means you have no trust in Hadith. That's why they choose Abu Huraira first. So it's pretty much normal. We were not shocked. We were not surprised about it. But the question that they raised, even though they, they highlight them so much, and it, it seems like very difficult question to answer, but we see it's, it's pretty much normal to think is a, a normal student of knowledge can understand it. They don't have to have a alimia degree or a master in Islamic studies. A normal student who can actually read uh, hadith and look at hadith, kitabs, etc. they can answer this question. So the first question was, how come Abu Huraira report these many hadith in four years time or three years time? Okay, what does these many hadith like? What is the number? So if you go to hadith uh, Sahabi, those Sahaba who reported hadith, and there is some book, there are some books which actually outline, they say how many hadith were reported be, by the Sahabi. The first book, that did this job is called Musnadeh Baqi ibn Makhlad. Baqi ibn Makhlad, a scholar from 270 Hijri around that time, he wrote a, he compiled hadith collection, like all the hadith in one place. And he outlined that Abu Hurairah who reported 5,374. This is the number, and some say 73, but let's take 74. 5,374 hadith were reported by Abu Huraira. And then after Baqi ibn Makhlad, who died around 270, uh, we find Allama ibn Hazm, a scholar from Andalusia. Baqi ibn Makhlad also from Andalusia, from Spain. Ibn Hazm from Spain, and he kind of summarized the muqaddima, the introduction of Baqi ibn Makhlad in his book called Asma'u Sahabati Ruat wa ma li kulli wahidin min al adad very small book that you can find it online and even in English as well. So the number of the, Sahaba, the name of the Sahaba who engaged in narrating hadith and the number of the hadith that they narrated. And this confirms as well, the same number 5,374. And then we find Ibn Jawzi, 
a later scholar, uh, late six, sixth century Hijri, 597. So he has a book uh, also about the number. Basically, all the ulama, they quoted this number 5,374. So people get uh, amazed, oh, I mean, shocked. How come Abu Huraira reports these many hadiths in only three years or four years, a period of time? But my brothers and sisters, we, this is no question because we have already discussed Abu Huraira was so dedicated. He didn't have any other job or home to be worried. He was homeless and jobless. He was dedicated and he was a boarding student. Into, you got to con consider this one. Whereas the other Sahaba, if you look at them, uh, they already explained to you that they used to do munawaba in tiyab, meaning all turn, uh, turns. Some of them would come today, some of them other day. This is how they used to do it. But Abu Huraira was Ahl Sufa and he was always with Rasul. Then you need to consider that Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he got a wide range of students, big number of students who transmitted lots of his hadiths from him. Then you need to consider that he actually died very late in 57 Hijri. 57 Hijri, so he got more than 40, like a decade uh, completely after Rasulullah. Approximately, a, I'm sorry, uh, a half a century, five decades after Rasulullah. So that means long time he was able to uh, report this hadith. You see two alim in your community, two scholars in your community, and both of them are the same level of knowledge, but one of them is a speaker, Another is not speaker. He doesn't find it comfortable to speak or to give bayan or lecture in much. Then you would think uh, you will see only one of them is speaking and giving bayan, and you think, oh, maybe this is the great scholar. No, in reality, both of them are knowledgeable. But they both learn the same ilim, but one got the opportunity to, to convey this ilim to other people. Other one maybe he's busy with something else, and that's why when we say you should remember this. When we say Abu Huraira report the most highest number of hadith, we don't mean Abu Huraira is the knowledgeable Sahabi, is the most knowledgeable Sahabi. No, we believe that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the most knowledgeable Sahabi. It is mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari by Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu an. He says, Wakana huwa a'lamana. And Abu Bakr was the most knowledgeable person among us. That's different discussion. So just because one, someone is reporting hadith doesn't mean he is the knowledgeable. So Abu Huraira and all the other Sahaba, many of them, they shared the same ilim, but because Abu Huraira got long time after, like five decades almost, and then he got long, large amount of students, so his knowledge got actually spread more. Doesn't mean he, did, any other Sahaba didn't know, didn't know this ilim. They knew it, but his ilim, Abu Huraira's ilim got more spread because of his uh, teaching. And <clears throat> another thing that we need to understand that the hadith that Abu Hurairah recorded, it's not only recorded by himself. You can see that same hadith are recorded by other Sahaba as well. So yeah, Abu Hurairah hadith are most, more widespread, but you see his hadith actually reported by other Sahaba. So let's say if you have any issue, uh, the Quranis or anyone about Abu Hurairah, then what about other Sahaba? They also recorded the same hadith maybe with the different wordings, et cetera. So therefore no issues. But now inshallah, I'll go, to, uh, go through a kind of a statement of Allama Hussain Ahmad Madani and I'll explain that inshallah. Allama Hussain Ahmad Madani, a scholar from India, subcontinent India, he's to teach in Darul Um Dauban. <clears throat> and he said, okay, before I mention his statement again, I want to mention actually another point that when we find in hadith collections, this imam of hadith, for let's say Imam Abu Dawood, for instance, he knew 300,000 hadith. Or let's say Imam Bukhari, he knew, for instance, 500,000 hadith. People get confused when, when they hear this kind of thing, 500,000 hadith, 300,000. They think, oh, how come? That's the middle of was just was always just talking and talking and talking, and that's why 500,000 hadith were reported from him. It's actually uh, those people who get, like, we should uh, clarify to the people as well when we say these big numbers. Muhaddisun, their style of counting hadith is not same as we might think. The scholars of hadith, they will count every hadith as separate, like every narration as separate. Let's say one hadith is report, reported by 50 Sahabi, same hadith they heard from Rasulullah, 50 Sahabi. 
and now they transmitted. Abu Huraira transmitted to his students. Ibn Abbas transmitted to his students. All the other Sahaba transmitted to their students. Now everyone transmitted like generation by generation. It was transmitted to the people like let's say third century Hijri. Hijri. Abu, uh, I mean Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmizi. They come in the middle of the third century Hijri. So they got these hadiths, the same hadith, but from the through the students of Ibn Abbas to the students of Ibn Omar, uh, Abdullah ibn Masood and others. So now the same hadith got lots of sanad, perhaps maybe hundreds of chain of narration for one single hadith. But Muhaddisun counts each sanad as one hadith. So therefore, the statements are very minimum. The hadith, actually hadith are very minimum. But because of these students and the chain of narration, now you got the same information from your five friends. The information is same, but you, you, you can say, I have five sources. So ulama, they, when they count hadith, they count the sources as well. One thing. Second thing is, sometimes the hadith have very slight differences in wordings. Maybe someone said, uh, uh, bainama. Someone said, baina. So just this word, bainama and baina. This kind of slight differences in wordings also are counted and considered as different hadith. They consider different hadith, they count them different. So therefore, uh, when we see here, Abu Hurairah reported 5,300 hadith, there will be lots of like repeated hadith, which we should bear this in mind. Like same hadith recorded by, let's say 800 students. You can imagine 800 students reporting from Abu Huraira. they report, so therefore it's not a big deal. But let's listen to um, <clears throat> Mawlana Hussain Ahmad Madani, rahimahullah. He says, Allah arhamu, and he said that in, in his lessons of Tirmizi, which is printed, I have the same point from many other books and I can say it from my own record as well, but I feel like it's, it's important to have some sort of like to, to appreciate the uh, ulum of our predecessors. No one just to think, oh, I'm a researcher and I'm a just scholar. So just everything say by from my own record. And in my opinion, this is what we are, uh, you know, uh, we are having issues today. Everyone has my, in my opinion, everyone have to say in my opinion. But let's look at the early predecessors. Allama Hussain al-Madani puts it very nicely, very simply and very briefly. Inshallah, I'll explain each, each and every single point uh, very briefly. And maybe we'll just go over seven, maybe for uh, 10 minutes and then inshallah within that time we'll uh, finish. So Mawlana Hussain al-Madani says, you shouldn't be surprised and you shouldn't be shocked if Abu Huraira reported 5,000 and so on hadith in very short period of time, because Abu Huraira has these two, uh, four qualities. And if any students are listening today, they should actually, we should try myself. We should try to acquire these five qualities in our lifetime as well. The first thing is Mula Zamat. Obviously, Madani is saying in Urdu. So Mula Zamat, which means dedication. And we already heard from Ibn Omar. He said, Wakunta al Zamana. You are the most dedicated students of Rasul Islam. That's true. Abu Huraira has no jobs, no family, no home, staying in the boarding madrasa, learning day in and day out. So therefore, yes, he is the most knowledgeable person. He got the chance to learn more. So that's the first uh, uh, quality, dedication. Second quality is tayakuz, meaning being alert and aware, what to learn and at what point, what to ask question at which point. He was ready always to ask the appropriate question. And we know uh, people say, as nisful ilim. Asking question is half of your knowledge. Meaning, if you have ilim, then you have more question in your mind to ask your teacher. And if you ask valid questions, then that is two benefit. Number one, it shows your intellectual level. Secondly, because of your question, your teacher will be uh, give you and shower you with more knowledge and more knowledge. So Abu Hira was in that level of tayakkuz. And I don't have time to actually uh, in, uh, uh, like explain this from Hadith actual narrations. The third, uh, narration, uh, third quality that Abu Huraira had, it's barak. So first one is dedication. Second one is being aware and alert. It's not like you just come lesson and sleeping and uh, distracted by device and all that stuff. No, rather he was tayakuz, always into lesson, focus and mind in lesson. The third quality is the Rasulullah ki dua ki baraka. Like the, the baraka, the blessing of Rasulullah's dua. We have lots of narration to actually mention but we find in Sahih Muslim and Bukhari and many other hadith collections that Rasulullah actually made special du'as for Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. In many occasions, Rasulullah did that. Like we find, 
in one occasion that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu asked Ya Rasulullah, like, make a dua for me that I don't forget anything. That answer, that answer. like, never I forget, never think. So Islam made dua, this, uh, made this special dua for Abu Hurairah and who, and then some other Sahaba, they were, uh, you know, present in that dua. They said, oh, Ya Rasulullah, make the same dua for us. So Islam said, no. Sabakaka, sabakakuma biha Abu Hurairah. Abu Hurairah got ahead, meaning he got the dua. He will not get forget anything. And there are lots of other uh, narrations you will find. They are very well known and available. That's why I'm not mentioning like Rasulullah uh, gave dates and sometimes Rasulullah gave in other ways that if you keep this, you'll never forget. So this shows that Abu Hurairah who had this baraka of dua of Rasulullah strong memory, never forgetting. And that's how you see Imam Bukhari, the, one of the most intelligent man, man in Islamic history, when he uh, structured a chapter about hibs, about memorizing and preserving no, uh, ilim, uh, hibs al ilim, he actually, in that chapter of Bukhari, he only recorded Abu Huraira's hadith, indicating that Abu Huraira was more, one of the most ahfazul uh, ulum al-shari'iyya in Islam. And the fourth reason that Monarch, uh, Abu Hassan, uh, Hassan al-Madani is saying, is talimi mashkala. That after Rasulullah, Abu Hurairah didn't sit at home and he didn't stop learning or teaching, rather he kept teaching. So these are the four reasons. Dedications, then dedication, he just dedication, then being a lot and being into the lesson and being passionate, then the barakat, the blessing of Rasulullah's du'as and also being involved and engaged in teaching after Rasulullah. You see lots of students, mashallah, they pass the exam in the first place and second place, this kind of thing. But after graduation, they start doing something else. Maybe they find it is good to do business, some other jobs. It's okay. So that means now they will not be able to develop their uh, skill that they achieve from university, from madrasa, from any other institution. But because Abu Hurairah actually did the same thing, so he was able to propagate, like to uh, meaning uh, to promote and to uh, convey these many hadiths. <clears throat> Okay, so now finally about this point, I will quote, uh, and those who understand Arabic, they should refer to the article. It's published in Al Muhawirun. There is a website, nice website. I, they, they publish articles about hadith and the authenticity of the hadith in Arabic. So in Al Muhawirun, they published an article in 2020. Two researchers, they did the research and like real research about it. Their name are Fatima Imad and Maryam Al-Hubal, or Maryam Al-Habal maybe. So Fatima Imad and Maryam Al-Hubal, let's say, these two uh, researchers, they, they uh, did this research. Very well uh, done, mashallah, well, uh, well uh, written. In that book, uh, in the article, in the research article, they say very nicely that we actually analyzed, we actually went through the hadith that Abu Hurairah recorded. Mashallah, they, they actually utilize the new technology as well as the original sources of hadith and all the stuff. And then they came to the conclusion. I'm, I'm just going to read the conclusion very briefly. They said that obviously we got the number 5,374. And then they said the hadith that we have, many of them are re repeated. You know, the sanad, the same hadith by re recorded by many, many students. That's why the repeated hadith. So if we actually exclude those repeated hadith, they found out, I, I mean, they found out 4,074 of them are repeated. Can you imagine 500, 5,374 and amongst them, 4,074 of them are repeated. And they did real research, like they themselves, they counted. And after that, that means we got only 1,300 hadith. So why are you so shocked? Just because you had, so that means those people who accuse Abu Hurairah being saying, oh, how come he reported those many hadiths in Shadda? They actually, they didn't carry out any study, any research. They're just relying on someone else's statement and just, just accusing Abu Hurairah based on someone else's statement. And my brother and sister, it's interesting to mention that these same people, they don't believe in hadith. And they say, oh, hadith is not well, but they, in order to accuse Abu Hurairah, they are taking someone else's information and they're accusing him without verification, without any sort of uh, uh, like uh, analysis and investigation. Yeah, so now we go only 1,300 hadith without reputation. Now, <clears throat> they did another research. 
about the same topic, that these hadiths, are they recorded by any other Sahabi or only recorded by Abu Hurairah? And I can, uh, I myself give you a, ref a, a reference, which is Jami'a Tirmizi. We call it Sunan Tirmizi as well. So in that kitab, you go to eight and every single hadith you will see, Imam Tirmizi in each chapter, he records one or two, like few hadith, and after a hadith, each hadith, he will say, Wafil babi an an an. So he'll say, in the same topic, you had hadith from this sahabi, that sahabi, that sahabi. That. So he lists a long list of sahaba, five, four, six, sometimes more than that, sometimes less than that. So if you just look at this, and I did that, I have been teaching, so uh, I'm Jama Tirmizi in uh, Madani as well as uh, in uh, Kuwait al-Islam. And I have found out by myself that any hadith that is recorded by Abu Hurairah, you'll see at the end of of Il Babi and Jabir, of Il Babi and Aisha, of Il Babi and Ibn Masud, of Il Babi and Ali. Jin. Same thing. Then that means Abu Hurairah, the hadith Abu Hurairah recorded, is also recorded by many other Sahaba. Maybe wordings are different, but the topic is same. So why would you just accuse Abu Hurairah? It's not actually accusing Abu Hurairah. You are trying to accuse the entire Sunnah, but you are just taking Abu Hurairah as a as a signboard, and you, you want to you know lay him down, and then you just a kind of a, a refuse to accept hadith. That's why uh, you are only targeting Abu Hurairah. So in fact, if you look at Tirmizi and stuff, then you'll find that actually Abu Hurairah was trustworthy. That's why all the hadith that he recorded are found from other Sahaba. It shows the accuracy, the accuracy and the excellence that Abu Hurairah had in his narration. Okay, and, and then uh, in this article, al muhawirin article, they found out that the hadith that they recorded are recorded by other Sahabi, almost all of them are found from other Sahaba. Different wordings, different maybe style and structure. Only maximum maybe 10 hadiths will be found that are only reported by Abu Hurairah, not by anyone else. So see, no issue with the hadith of Abu Hurairah, that his hadiths are supported and strengthened and actually uh, like uh, acknowledged by other Sahaba's hadiths and you have proof. So what's the problem with Abu Hurairah if he report these many ahadiths? Okay, now the second thing, as you see my brothers and sisters here, question from, Sahab, uh, from the Sahaba, we are going very quickly, inshallah. This is something that shows, that implies the accountability among Sahaba. Mashallah, the Sahaba is not just reporting hadith day in and out, no. They would be very careful. And as we said, Abu Hurairah himself would remind each other, Man kazaba mutaamidan, if you make lie against Rasulullah, it will be means for you to jahannam, go to Jahannam. Now, we see that Sahaba, they would gather and they would ask each other, what hadith are you teaching? What hadith are you preaching? Like conveying to other people. They would ask each other. And if they think, if any Sahaba think, okay, this person is teaching some hadith which are not maybe uh, transmitted in the right way, maybe. Rasulam said something, but the Sahabi is, maybe Rasulam said something very special for a special moment, and this Sahabi is generalizing it. So the other Sahaba will say, okay, don't report this hadith like that. So they will have these kind of meetings. They'll have these kind of sessions. Nowadays, we can say al-hiwar al-ilmi, academic discussion. We have this. We have review system. So Sahaba had this system, which actually gives us more confidence and strength. So yes, Sahaba had this uh, discussion. They sometimes asked Abu Hurairah, okay, Abu Hurairah, you report this hadith and that hadith. So we kind of find it a bit different or some stuff like that. So they did this, this question. And again, it's not only Abu Hurairah, you will find it about Aisha, you'll find it about Ibn Abbas, you'll find it about Ibn... all the Sahaba did that. I'm not going through any example at this point, but I just summarize the main point. Now it was academic review, academic discussion among Sahaba, and they would ask each other, not because they, they, they accuse someone of lying or anything. No, they just want to make sure that everyone is transmitting the hadith in the right direction. That's it. Okay, let's move on to the third one. <clears throat> we are going very fast. Uh, inshallah, within 10 minutes, we'll finish. And then we'll if you have any question, we'll answer that. The next point is hiding some hadith. Again, I, I read, obviously, I'm not going to mention those sources then, but I read some of the people, they accuse Abu Hurairah. Oh, look, Abu Hurairah is hiding hadith. In one hand, they have questioned that Abu Hurairah reported every hadith. Now they have questioned that Abu Hurairah hides some hadith. So it's actually recorded in Bukhari and other kitab that Abu Hurairah said, Hafiz tu aini. Hafiz tu Rasulullah we are aini. I actually learned from Rasulullah two bags, two uh, kind of uh, containers, two bags of hadith. 
he's, he's using metaphorical terms. And then said, I only spread amongst you only one bag and I didn't, in, uh, didn't uh, in, uh, disclose the other bag. I didn't uh, open the other bag. So some, some people say, look, he's hiding hadith. But these people, they should have understood that when Abu Hurairah is saying this, it shows his intelligence and it shows his accuracy and it shows his awareness that he's not spreading hadith anywhere and everywhere. But he's very careful where to teach what. Now, my brothers and sisters, if you go to a Jumu'ah Bayan Masjid, like as an Imam, uh, you know, when we do, when we deliver khutbah in Masjid, we have a different type of audience. When we teach in Madrasa, in, you know, institution, be it Madrasa, be it university, college, or whatever, your approach will not be the same. So Abu Radhan is saying, I have two we'a, but for my public lectures, I open only one of them, and the second one is, is closed, not for everyone. And it's pretty much normal. So Rasulullah uh, and Sahaba, if you look at their biography, look at their lifestyle, see, they used to do the same thing. And let me give you one example, and then we'll move on. In Sahih Muslim, and many other books, you find the story of Mu'az ibn Jabal, long story. Uh, Rasulullah teach, he was, uh, uh, he was riding behind Rasulullah in the same camel or same donkey, sorry, Himar donkey. And Rasulullah taught him some, taught him something. Uh, in many books, this is mentioned that, uh, anyone who says la ilaha illallah, meaning anyone who believes in la ilaha illallah will enter Jannah. Now, Mu'adhan said, okay, Ya Rasulullah, as you are giving this, shall I not just inform people about it? Shall I not go ahead and people say, inform, inform people, anyone who says la ilaha illallah will enter Jannah? Rasulullah said, no, 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 don't do that. If you do that, some people will become lazy. They will think, oh, just saying la ilaha illallah is enough. We don't need to do salah, we don't need to go for hajj and spend money and all the stuff. Just saying la ilaha is enough. So look, Rasulullah is saying to Mu'az not to say this ilim to other people. But Rasulullah taught Mu'az this ilim. So that shows some ilim should be, some knowledge, some information should only be for the appropriate people, not for everyone. And Abu Hurairah did the right thing. He didn't mention everything. That shows his, his knowledge and his, the amount of his, his, his intelligence. That he's not those people just goes on and just show off their ilim everywhere and information, you know, no. When to speak to the people according to their understanding level. <clears throat> now, withdraw from the government of Bahrain. We see during the Khilafat of Umar al-Khattab, it is mentioned in Tabaqat ibn, uh, ibn Sa'ad again, that Umar radiallahu who sent Abu Huraira again to Bahrain. He said, oh, Abu Hurairah, look, you have been serving, you, you served as a governor of Bahrain during the lifetime of Rasulullah. So I want you to go again in Bahrain and to serve as a governor on behalf of my Islamic Khilafah. Abu Hurairah accepts that, that, accepts that. And then some enemies, like some people, they go like, jealous of Abu Hurairah, like, look, he's a governor, as well as the he's a great person, like he's doing everything like doing the job and also teaching and all the stuff. Some people, they kind of wrote a letter or inform Umar that, look, we are not happy with Abu Huraira. Uh, they made some uh, allegations, meaning the Umar then whose method was, whenever he would send, send someone to somewhere, he would always look after, like take care of them. Uh, he would ask about their uh, kingdom, about their governor, about their ruling, etc. Are they doing well or no? So some evil, obviously always, you have people, enemies, and uh, you know, jealous people. So some people, they kind of came to Umar and said, oh, we are not the happy, some people. So Abu, Abu Umar then who sent Abu uh, letter to Abu Huraira to come to Medina, Abu Huraira came. And Umar then said, okay, for now you stay in Medina and we'll do an investigation because we, we, ha we want to have accountability in the Islamic Khilafah because these people have made an accusation. So let me just, uh, let me see. So a few months later, Umar then who calls Abu Hunayr. And I'm saying the from so, same soul. Now, Umar, Umar says, I have investigated. And now if you can kindly go back to Bahrain, like you go to your job, back to your job. Abu Hunayr says, no, I'm not actually a politician, a political, uh, like this kind of uh, person to uh, diplomatic relationship and all the stuff. It's quite difficult for me. I'm more so into teaching and academic background. But yes, fair enough, you appointed me for one time and I was there just because Rasulullah did. So I just accepted your uh, proposal but for this time, please excuse me. He didn't accept it because he said, I, I have experience. If I go to there 
and I engage in those uh, diplomatic things, then I actually have less time to teach. So Abu Huraira prefer to teach in Medina. Umar says, okay, if you want to teach in Medina, go ahead. Medina is back to you. Like much of the number is again to your position and you just go ahead and teach, keep teaching. So there is no issue. Just uh, some people, they just want to find out any just brief, any small thing just to uh, go against Abu Hurairah. Or also, in fact, it is a, a, a plus point for Abu Hurairah that Umar investigated. He found it. Uh, he found Abu Hurairah who like completely innocent. And then he wants Abu Hurairah go back to Bahrain again. But Abu Hurairah refused at this point because he said, I have experienced that if you go to a governor as a governor, you don't have much time to teach. So good point. You should be praising Abu Hurairah for this. Okay, the next point is, was he against Ahlul Bayt? This is the acquisition of Shia people. They say, oh, look, Abu Hurairah reported hadith because he wasn't in the favor of Sahaba, Abu Ali, and all this. This is completely lying. Uh, because Abu Hurairah himself reported lots of hadith praising like the manaqib, the merits of Ali, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, Hassan ibn Hussein. It is mentioned in Musadr Hakim that he said, whenever Hassan ibn Hussein's name come, like he mentioned, Fafad at Ainaya, tears come from his eyes because of the you know, tragedy and the sad story that happened. So therefore, how can you, and I can refer you, my brothers and sisters, lots of hadith, like in Bukhari even, when uh, Imam Bukhari records hadith about Khaybar, Battle of Khaybar, Abu Hurairah records a hadith which is praising Ali radiallahu anh. In Bukhari and also in Muslim, we have a hadith praising Jafar. Abu Hurairah said, Kana khayran nasi ilal miski, lil maskini Jafar ibn Abi Talib. The best people to the miskin were Jafar ibn Abi Talib. So how can you say Abu Hurairah was against Ahlul Bayt? That's what, no, Abu Hurairah never was any, against anyone. He was always uh, like, with the major, like with the Sahaba, as a generation of Sahaba. And let me, before moving move to the next one, I mentioned some people, Abu Raya, a scholar from, not scholar kind of, is just a writer who claimed to be kind of Islamic scholar as well, perhaps. But he wrote against Abu Hurairah who was saying, oh, Abu Hurairah was just for food, he says in one occasion. And he, he gives an example or kind of uh, his, his proof from his, himself. He says, look, during, when there was some conflictions between Muawiyah and Ali, Radiallahu anhuma, there was you know issues between these two Sahaba, uh, Khilafa issues and stuff. So Abu Rayya claimed that at this point, perhaps apparently they say uh, apparently Abu Hurairah who used to pray behind Ali and he used to go and eat in the dastarkhana in the food mat of Muawiyah. This is how they say. And I, I've seen that some people without realizing they also quote this statement completely lie. So they say. Abu Hurairah, during the confliction, he's praying behind Ali and he's eating behind Muawiyah. How can, how can this be possible? Abu Hurairah never left Medina apart from these two times, Bahrain and Hajj and all this time. Like, during the lifetime of Rasulullah, he moved from Medina with Rasulullah or for Bahrain. And after Rasulullah, he only went to Bahrain for, like, for a period of time just to be governor on behalf of Umar. And then he came back to Medina. He was always in Medina. So how, and Ali Adil was in Kufa and Muawiyah was in Syria. Now, do you think Abu Hurairah had this kind of personal private jet air, I mean, uh, a helicopter or something, the namaz time he will go to Kufa to pray behind Ali and if food, food time he would go to Syria to eat with Muawiyah when he's the Starkhana and then he would come back to Medina to teach his students. Was there any helicopter or something? So, and I, we asked them, can you provide any reference like Bukhari Muslim even or any this kind of Hadith literature or any, any uh, they couldn't prove any book. They presented some unreliable poetry book, like a book which deals with Arabic poetry. Someone maybe, you know, from that imagination, obviously poetry was shu'ara gaun. Many of the poets, many of them, not all of them, many of them, they have no guidance. So maybe some of them just imagined a story and just made it up. And these Abu Rayya, he referred to those story book, uh, 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 poetry book, not hadith book. They don't believe in hadith book, but they can believe and they can trust story, unreliable story books. This is the reality of the accusers who accuse against, against Abu Rayya. Last one, my brothers and sisters, is was he misogynistic? Quite interesting question. Fatima Marnisi from Morocco, a, a feminist writer, very extreme uh, feminist writer from America. Like she was from Morocco, but she studied in Paris and Morocco, uh, in America. And she wrote a book about uh, 
the um, Islam and women and all the other stuff, veil, about veil. And in that book, she kind of writes this, that she thinks Abu Huraira was a misogynistic and therefore he was reporting hadith against women. Astaghfirullah. Let me tell you one evidence that she presented. She says that Abu Huraira reported a hadith, which is recorded in all the kutub, like all Sahih Kitab, Bukhari, Muslim. Uh, I can tell you from, Bukhari, uh, from Muslim. Abu Huraira reported this hadith, a lady was punished, or a lady will be punished in the day of judgment because of the cut. Why? Because she uh, kind of kept it. She didn't give food to it and she didn't allow it to go out and eat by itself. So she kept it, she tied it up and she didn't provide food to the cat. So therefore uh, the cat died. And Rasulullah said, this woman will be punished because of this abuse to the animal. Okay, now this, uh, the, the feminists, they accuse Abu Hurairah, look, look, they say, oh, Abu Hurairah is reporting has against women, the woman is going to be punished because of the cut. How come this, how, how does this make sense? Like, just because he says, in fact, we, you should praise Abu Hurairah for that. He transmitted this hadith to us uh, from Rasulullah, which actually shows that Islam teach us to be kind and nice to the animal even, to the cat even. And Islam gives so much importance to the animal that you can't abuse a cat even. So you should have been praising Abu Huraira that he transmitted this hadith to, uh, to us, which shows the beauty of Islam, that Islam cares about the animals. Rather, you go and find out just because the word Imratun, a lady was punished, mentioned in the hadith, now you claim, uh, you claim Abu Huraira was misogynistic and woman hater. There's no actually a real connection to that. It's just, uh, the, obviously, when you have, uh, when you want to do something, even if you don't have any evidence, you make evidence. Quite interestingly, as I said, this hadith is actually a beauty of Islam. Quite interestingly, that same hadith has been recorded by many other Sahaba as well. Now, are you going to say all the other Sahaba are also women haters? Ibn Umar then who recorded the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. So what are you gonna say about Ibn Umar? Are you gonna say he's a woman hater as well? And how can you say Abu Hura a woman hater or misogynistic? He loved his mom and we showed you, we explained to you how he took care of his mom, non-Muslim mom, he took, he bring her from uh, Daos to Medina. She makes dua for her, she go, uh, I mean, Abu Hurairah goes to Rasulullah to make dua for his mom. So loves for woman. He gets married, he has love for his wife and he uh, has love for his daughter. He choose a good husband for his daughter, Sayyid al -Musayyab. So a person who does all the stuff, how can you accuse him of being misogynistic? And not only that, let me present to you another hadith, which is Sayyid Sanad recorded in Musnad Ahmad. And this is the last point I'm going to mention, uh, is <clears throat> the hadith recorded in Musnad Ahmad. I quoted, I'm quoting from there. It says, uh, Abu Hurairah will record this hadith from Rasulullah. خياروهم خياروهم now, how are you going to say about it? Abu Hurairah says, the best Muslims are those خياروهم لنسائهم who are responsible and best to their wives meaning who, they, who treat their wife very nicely. So Abu Hurairah, so now are you going to say Abu Hurairah is feminist like you, like he's just always talking about women? No, Abu Hurairah is not, no feminist, no misogynist. He's a Sahabi, he's a great Muslim and real man. So he's reporting how, well, the way he learned from Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, the best of you is the one who is best to his family, like female members of the family, the wife and all the others. So you go, here you go. You should actually now claim that Abu Huraira was actually female, uh, like he was, uh, he was feminist maybe like you, but obviously you can't accept him because you already stated him as misogynistic. My brothers and sisters, last point, conclusion. In conclusion, I just want to <clears throat> get over one hadith and inshallah finished. It is mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Just let me find out the wordings. So, <clears throat> Abu Hurairah who says that in one occasion, uh, it is recorded in Muslim, I just need to find out, but let me just tell you the main summary of the hadith. So he uh, kind of requests Ya Rasulullah make dua that entire, that anyone who hears me, man sami'a anni yuhibburi wa hibbu ummi, the nearest words, that anyone who hears about me should love me and my mom. So Salam said, okay, Rasulullah made the same dua. And it is recording the Sahih Sanad, Sahih Sanad, Sahih Hadith, Sahih Kitab. Now, this is the conclusion of today's uh, uh, session is that Abu Hurairah made a dua and mentioned in Sahih Muslim and Rasulullah made this dua, Rasulullah accepted and he made the dua that, well, Allah make Abu Hurairah 
and his mom beloved to all Muslims. Now, Alhamdulillah, it's been 1500 years almost, like more than 1400 years. And Muslims across the globe who believe in Quran and Sunnah, who are Sunni Muslims, they love Abu Hurairah. They always mention Abu Hurairah's name and they very passionate about Abu Hurairah. So look, it's a kind of miraculous thing that Abu Hurairah asked Rasulullah to make dua for him to be beloved to the Muslims and Rasulullah's dua got accepted that until now, all the Muslim majority, they have been loving Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. We love Abu Hurairah. And Rasulullah said in a hadith recorded by Anas ibn Malik that al maru ma'aman ahabba, a person will be with whom he loves. So we love Abu Hurairah and we hope inshallah we'll be with Rasulullah with Abu Hurairah and with all these great people. Um, I apologize that it was very fast, perhaps very short and also I went beyond the time, but uh, I would like to say Jazakallah, Jazakumullah khairan to all of you who attended today and also to our brother and you know, uh, respected brother Ustaz Huzaifa Saleh from Civil Service of Ilim for uh, organizing this, this nice uh, presentation. Jazakumullah khairan wa akhru da'wan an alhamdulillahi rabbil alam. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh. Uh, once again, mashallah, as always, was very insightful and alhamdulillah as students of hadith, um, this particular companion who we always come come to know of alhamdulillah it gives us a very good insight into his life and i think now every time we will read uh, his name we'll have a very uh, vast background of of his life inshallah yeah Sheikh, the one question here is uh, is there a opinion with regards or what is the most authentic opinion regarding the date of his demise if that okay means. so there are quite a few opinions we find 57 58 59 but my uh, brothers and sisters who are listening, I would say that Allama Zahid al kawthari rahimahullah, a great scholar from previous century who died in 19, I mean, 1371 AH. We are living in 1443 and he died in 1371. He was from uh, Istanbul, from Turkey, but he lived in uh, later on after Kamal, Kamal Ataturk took control of the country, he moved to Egypt and he died there. So Allama Zahid al kawthari mentions very important usul in Tanib al Khatib that when we have, and obviously it's quite normal to find different opinions in regards to the birth day, date of birth, and also year of death for Sahaba, for Tabin and early generations. In these things, Imam Allah Mazhar al-Qasari says from Hadith perspective, Usul Hadith, the cautious option that we should take is the earliest, the, the earliest date in terms of the uh, death and also the earliest, uh, the latest date in terms of the uh, birth. For example, if we have two opinions or three opinions, someone was born in 90, 91, 92. Zaid Kasari said we should take the third comment, 93. And in terms of death, if we have three opinions, let's say again, 90, 91, 92. Allah Mazhar Kasari said we should take the first one, 90. The reason is because if you consider the the latest one in terms of birth date and the fastest, the earliest one in terms of uh, death, then that means you are not actually uh, falling into any uh, assumption. It could be that if you consider the latest option in terms of death, that means you are saying he was alive that time, until that time, and you are proving many students got to learn from him in the last two years. But in reality, maybe he didn't learn, uh, uh, or he wasn't alive at, at, until that time. So therefore it's precaution to say that he was alive until the fastest, earliest option. And anyone who claims to be his student in the last two years will say, okay, we need to pause and we need to investigate that. So it's, as an out of precaution, we should take the earliest one and it's the Zahabi and all other ulama, they consider 57. Subhanallah, that was very insightful. Jazakallah khairan for Sheikh. That was very interesting.